Welcome to the Bat Cave, aka Superhero Stuff You Should Know. This is Ben of the Ben Cave, and with me, as usual, is it's Andrew in my cave of wonders. <laughs> <laughs> The Indeed Wizard's Cave. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> Last week, we ranked all the Bat Caves in live action film and TV, and this week, we're actually going to go into one of our favorite topics unmade shit. Specifically, the unmade Bat Caves. Unmade, unmade shit. That's what we do the, here. Indeed. The ones that you didn't get to see on film and TV. So, like we talked about last time, the 1943 serial, The Batman, was the first time we got the formal name of the Bat's Cave, but what happened afterwards? What about the Bat Caves we never got to see? And we have some concept art stuff for the uh, visuals and the video, uh, but a lot of the stuff is stuff that only exists in script form, so it's still going to be very oral, uh, aural, I should say, friendly. Aural. Aural and oral friendly, I guess, <laughs> for, uh, for everybody. So That's another Kevin Smith gym. Yes. If I can give, give you aural. Yes, so <laughs> let's go into it. So the 1940 serials don't have any unmade concept art to go over. So let's go into the 1966 film. The Batcave, uh, as we went over it last week, last week, was basically one of the iconic Batcaves that people saw. But it didn't always look like that. So let's take a look at this. In the auditions for the 1966 series, they not only had different costumes, as we can see with Batman, because we talked yeah. about that in the unmade Batsuit, but they also had their own makeshift bat cave just for this. So, as you can see, it's a lot smaller than it would look like in the series. You can actually see it even better on the images on the right for uh, the actors who didn't get the part, which is Lyle Wagner and Peter Dale. Uh, and you see it's kind of a, it's a smaller place. You see actual stalactites and stalagmites. Uh, you see <laughs> kind of the beginnings of the bat computer from the 60s show. But, uh, yeah, it's a little bit of a darker version. Of, uh, the, of the Dozier verse that uh, we didn't really get to see. Maybe you could say it's an early version of the Batcave before it expands into what we'd end up seeing in the TV show. But I thought this was worth checking out. It's cool. I mean, it's like a dark, dark Batman 66. So yeah, that's, that's interesting in and of itself. I mean, again, if they kind of updated the computers and did something kind of like this for the next Reeves film, that'd be awesome, actually. Yeah, that's true. You know, even if it's kind of a small room, still kind of cool though you know yeah 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 uh we are reacting or will have reacted by the time this is react uh into more of this in terms of the auditions in our ten dollar tier live show on batman auditions and batman screen tests so uh andrew and i are actually going to watch this the footage that exists of these auditions live uh along with a few fans and stuff it'll already have been done by the time this comes out but, uh, you know, check that out if you're a part of it. And if you join the $10 tier, you can sort of retroactively watch it in, uh, you know, in all of our backlog. So you can still check out that episode later. Moving on then. So uh, after the 1960s show, we have the Batcave from Michael Usland's Return of the Batman, which we've hinted at before in terms of the script treatment. I can't go too much into details on it. We have not done a deep dive, a formal deep dive into it. But it is basically have some of the formal stuff that you would expect from the Batcave at the time. Batman himself references original stories there, including the um, pretty much the penny plunderers for the giant penny, which is where the giant penny comes from, as you can see here from the 1940s. Uh, and Dinosaur Island, which has the T-Rex, which is, uh, <laughs> I guess, Batman's using a bow and arrow against that, <laughs> that T-Rex in this. <laughs> Maybe he should use a gun in this instance. <laughs> I mean, I refuse to use guns. I mean, it's not Robin's like just humans. dead right here on the bottom here. <laughs> I mean, the gun rules should apply to humans. I think. Like, <laughs> this is kind of a fu interesting topic, but yeah, yeah, yeah. I can see that definitely. Uh, but yeah, if we if we go back to basically <laughs> he the like pulls out an Uzi, he's like, I've been waiting for this moment. <laughs> Fucking dinosaurs, not humans. Yes, not humans. Still okay. It is described as a multi-chambered, huge subterranean fortress filled with eerie stalactites and stalagmites that are a bit frightening. <laughs> this should be a starkly visual, wondrous set. We're looking now at the Dick Spring sort of diagram for the Batcave. This shit's cool. so fun. Like mm -hmm. it's just so like like we talked about. When um, we talked about Freakazoid really quick, but toyetic, mm -hmm. like everything's just so toyetic here. You could just make everything a toy. Yeah, it's like everybody. Bright, simple colors. Kid. Yeah. Yeah. You can create your own Batcave. 
You know, you can pick and choose yeah. and stuff. Or you can be like me and be an adult and get a toy T-Rex and a giant penny <laughs> and a Joker card. So <laughs> why not? I'm a grown man. Own office. I do what I want. <laughs> I so, mean, uh, that's how it is. That's our generation, man. You know, like our yeah. parents' generation weren't doing this too much, no, but our generation so totally is. Mm -hmm. You know, so they do. They do have the Hall of Trophies in this script, and it does describe that there is the giant penny, the quote unquote full scale mechanical dinosaur, and a trick jail cell. Now, what is this jail cell? Uh, this seems to replace the giant Joker card, at least in the script, but this is actually from the comics. So in the comics, Joker had a trick jail cell where when Batman and Robin stepped on it, it would the basically the, the ground would switch so that Joker would be on the outside of the bars and Batman and Robin would now be <laughs> behind the bars, as you can see here. So that actually makes it into use the script here. So that's oh, kind of cool. Uh, Batcave is also said to have three chambers, computers and crime fi files, a laboratory, a boat dock, and garage area. And uh, while I won't get too detailed into it because we'll save it for another episode, there actually is an action sequence involving the mechanical T-Rex inside the Batcave in the script. So. In the Ninja Turtles Batman one, he like gets on top of the... Oh yeah, he does. The yeah. uh, T-Rex as well. Uh, it yeah. was Michelangelo, I think. Yeah. Which that was fun. That's cool. That's yeah. cool. But yeah, it is, it is a robot dinosaur. It's not just a random thing that... Bruce loves from childhood. It is actually a robotic dinosaur from Dinosaur Island. And it occasionally comes to life like it does here in the comic Heart of Hush, art by Dustin Wynn. So that's, that's cool. pretty cool. Next, then, is the Tom Mankiewicz script, The Batman. No, not the one from 2022, but from 1982. So we've covered <laughs> this a lot, but it did have one of the early versions of a Batcave. And the origins of it will sound very familiar to our listeners or viewers, even if you've never heard of our podcast before, it'll still sound familiar, and here's why. So in this script, um, Bruce Wayne has always kind of been a scientific genius. Even as a kid, uh, he was able to build a hologram of himself and fool his father with it. And so later on, when he's having his standard moments of remembering his past and his childhood with his parents, he has the hologram on, but because it's been so long, the laser of the hologram ends up burning a hole into the Wayne Manor basement and you hear, quote, a dull echoing thud as the plaster on the other side hits the bottom of an unseen cavernous space below. So Bruce wonders what's behind, like what's under the basement, what the hell's going on? So he uses his flashlight to peek and see, quote, an immense cavern that trails down and away from the blackness, a network of aged timbers intersect themselves, shoring up the side of the foundation. So Bruce decides to check it out. He uses a rope to go down, use the flashlight to sort of check the walls and he's kind of seeing just the outlines of the cave. And he looks around with a flashlight, and he, there's this area of solid black until he sees a whole bunch of yellow eyes appear. And suddenly, a colony of bats swarm around Bruce. So this foreshadows Batman Begins decades later, where Bruce ends up being surrounded by bats in the future Bat Cave. And Mankiewicz writes, quote, A low moan is heard from Bruce. It rises, gathers in volume and intensity, gradually becoming a deep, booming, guttural roar at once a scream of total pain and a cry of defiance. The terrified bats scream back in a maze of hot and cold light, bouncing off beating black wings. So that's the early version of it. We did not get the roar from Christian Bale in it. <laughs> he screamed plenty in the bat suit, but not in this scene. So uh, that's we did true. get a version It wouldn't have of fit. It. The scream might not have fit. <laughs> Probably not. This is a baptism, so dude. Remember? Yeah. I mean, yeah, it maybe is. some people scream at their baptism, but... Usually it's kind of a solemn event. <laughs> if you're a young baby, maybe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, that's the only, yeah, that's the only time. Yeah. yeah. So that is kind of the discovery of the Batcave written into the Tom Mankiewicz script way, way before we got Batman Begins. Uh, so Bruce becomes Batman, and you start seeing the evolution of the Batcave. At one point, you see that they built the stairwell that goes from the cave to Wayne Manor because you can't just drop in from the rope every single time. And it's also implied that Bruce sleeps in the Batcave a lot because he just sits on a cot at one point. Upside when down? When Alfred is talking to him. Not upside down. We didn't get to 89 yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Be a hell of a headache when you wake up. Dude, yeah. You can't. <laughs> not, not for very long, man. <laughs> it's like, ugh. <laughs> Great on your spinal compression, though. Gotta tell you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, after a bit, Batman earns Commissioner Gordon's trust, and we get a montage that at one point mentions that Batman stops the penny plunderers. Another says that the Joker uses a mechanical dinosaur to terrorize the Gotham amusement park. 
And the montage <laughs> ends with Alfred, of course, going to a grandfather clock. He does not, however, set the time to 1047, uh, like in a lot of different <laughs> versions. I don't think that was around at the time, but the grandfather clock was, thanks to the serial. So it just says that he throws a switch behind the grandfather clock, which seems kind of precarious emergency-wise, but, you know, security-wise, but whatever. And that's what opens up to the Batcave. Also worth noting later that in the script, Dick Grayson, Robin is in the script, discovers the Batcave through the grandfather clock, foreshadowing 45-year-old Chris O'Donnell sliding through the silver closet to discover the Batcave in Batman Forever. So, that's right. That's cool. Yeah. Uh, the Batcave is now described as a gothic cavern walls, uh, as having gothic cavern walls that are now spotless. The first section of the cave is filled with trophies, dominated by the huge mechanical Tyrannosaurus Rex. Next to it is the giant penny. Dozens of other trophies are arranged nearby, camera pans. The next area of the cave is devoted to exercise, weights, Nautilus equipment, rings, even a trapeze. And then camera pans again, another section of myriad state-of-the-art computers and a fully equipped crime lab, which is where Batman is working on the early version of the Batmobile. So we follow Alfred in and tell he basically tells Bruce, you have a phone call, and he indicates the phone inside the Batcave, which, of course, is the quote-unquote imposing red telephone set into the wall. Do you have one so, of these? I don't have a bat phone yet. You need to... <laughs> put it on going, my birthday list <laughs> yeah put it on the birthday list oh man we did not plan was... this internet this was not ben's <laughs> ploy to get one of these or was it <laughs> or maybe it so... was actually but yeah i mean I can you connect your <laughs> connect yourself <laughs> thing is how the fuck would you use this these days i know it's just like it's, it's just, just a prop it's just decoration really i mean i do have a red phone case Oh, yeah, so you have that. Phone. So that's that's on purpose, that right? That's 100% yeah. on purpose. That yeah. is on purpose, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, I don't have a, a, a bat phone that's like this. I do have the Shakespeare hit, as, we, show, as right. we showed in previous episodes, but I don't have a bat phone like this. There was a bat so, phone in the some... Batmobile, right? Yeah. At the time? Well. Was it also Which I'm sure red? was like, uh, yeah, I think so. Oh, Which I'm sure. sure was like a big thing at the time. It was just like, oh, he's got a phone in his car. That's amazing. Dude, it was, cell phones looking back came out so late, like, Mm -hmm. fucking like early 2000s or something it feels like we should have had them since the 80s i mean rich people did i guess but yeah yeah with the big anyway, antenna that's a whole other fucking thing yeah the michael douglas thing or whatever yeah but, <laughs> he's on um, his tie and he just does he just pulls it out yeah <laughs> it's a, yeah it's so, it's huge so badass at the time <laughs> my dad had a car phone back in the day in the mid 90s that was the real baller shit yeah yeah exactly so like the car phone is like oh man he's really rich he's got this stuff he Batman has all this amazing technology. Anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So your listeners might be wondering, okay, the T-Rex, the giant penny, but what happened to the Joker card? Well, it doesn't seem like it's in the Michael Uslan script, at least not in that section I read off, but it does appear later on in the Tom Mankiewicz script. The giant Joker card does appear when Joker makes, basically it makes it look like he's attacked Rupert Thorne in order to sort of, sort of to cover up the fact that he and Rupert Thorne were meeting. So... We do get the giant Joker card, and of course, it's going. It's implied that the Joker card ends up in the Batcave to sort of fulfill the trifecta of trophies in Batman's right. Batcave. Right. So that's cool. Uh, at one point, Batman destroys the Batcave in the script because, uh, or parts of the of the Batcave. Basically, the Joker claims that, "Hey, Batman, if you show up in public, I'm going to start killing people." And of course, nothing's as simple with the Joker. He has his own Batman imposters running around so that he can kill people and make Batman look bad. So uh, Bruce, in his rage, takes the head of the bat head battering ram from the Batmobile, which <laughs> would have been in that version of the Batmobile, and he basically just uses it to destroy parts of the crime lab In uh, at one point in the script when he's just pissed off at Joker. So uh, that would have been an interesting thing to see. I don't think we've really seen much of Batman destroying parts of his own equipment in rage in the live action movies. I know what happened at one point in, in B Taz. So uh, it makes sense that this would happen at some point. I mean, people are already so sensitive to Batman being too, too emo or too, <laughs> uh, like people th thought, some people thought Bale was a little bit too whiny. You know what I mean? When he was Bruce. So like a scene like this would have to be handled with some care in order to not make him seem too whiny or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. Lash out in anger a little bit too much, you know? I don't know. But, you know, it could work. I mean, people yeah. love angry Batman, so... Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. It does look like we got something similar when I showed that, like, screenshot of what looks like a deleted scene of Pattinson, like, throwing over a bunch of file cabinets and stuff. So 
maybe we're going to have something like that in the Batman that they cut. Who knows? Oh, dude. R-rated version. Let's do it, Reeves. HBO <laughs> Max. Yes. <laughs> so next up is the Burton, Tim Burton, Julie Hickson treatment written in 1985. We covered a lot of this in the Unmade Origins of Batman episode, so check that out. But we did get a training montage of Bruce where he sort of creates an early Batcave in the basement. So it says that he has an elaborate gym and trapeze set, highly evolved criminology and science labs, state-of-the-art computers, processor and tracking systems, all embellished with Bruce's massive trophy collection and obvious precursors of the Batcave. I'm guessing trophy collection would mean, in this case, like gymnastics trophies, martial arts stuff, that type of stuff in this right. case. Right, right, um, right. It's also said the basement is sort of a secret basement. It's said to be accessible through a secret hidden panel behind a fake bookcase in the mansion's library. So already they're like playing off of like his own secret training area. Yeah, proto. Yeah. Proto cave. Yeah. Later it says Bruce enters the now fully appointed bat cave by a secret entrance, a nearby barn located several hundred <laughs> yards from the mansion, which has been connected to the bat cave by an underground tunnel. So if you guys remember from last week, we covered this diagram that was done for the Batman dailies that featured this old disguised barn that kind of disguises the, um, the way for the bat plane and the Batmobile to return back to the Batcave and stuff that's close by the Wayne Manor. So Burton and Hickson were going by the really old, old comics on the script. Yeah. This is cool. Kind of cool though. I, yeah. I, I do like this. I mean, this, this is the kind of thing that really captures kids' imaginations, I think. Yeah, I can you see know? that. Yeah. yeah. Like imagine if you had all that stuff. Yeah, just imagining the layout uh, and like, I don't know. It's like something that you would kind of make a makeshift version with Legos too. I feel like, yeah, oh, that's just, that's where my mind goes. Like just trying to make this uh, layout for the bat cave. I just love that you could, all you would really need is some sort of just base play set, right? Or mm -hmm. stuff, but then you can like get your own Batmobile, get your own Batman. So if your favorite is like the Adam West Batmobile, but like Michael Keaton's Batman, you could do that in your own bat cave. You can yeah, pick and choose sure. whatever the fuck you want. They made they made a Batcave playset, right? They have to have. Yeah, yeah. Back in the day, at least a few. I did not have it, but yeah, uh, you know, I'm sure for a lot of kids that was like the thing. Comment below on that, but I'm sure I, Zach covered some of that in the uh, the Kenner stuff. Zach was like, he's like, you know, knows more about the figures than we do. I think even you, Ben. I think, but yeah. Mm -hmm. I might say this in the other other episode, but like I loved action figures, but I was never too much of the place. I never really. I probably had a couple, but mm -hmm. I don't know. I'm, I remember it like kind of not being my thing. I would just yeah. like play with them on a just a, t a table or something. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> even with the play sets like over there, like if my mm -hmm. aunt got it for me or some shit. Like I don't know. Yeah, that's just how I was, man. Uh, but I mean the V. Figures and the vehicles I was into. Vehicles a little bit less so, mm -hmm. but still, like, if it was a Batmobile, if it was a Power Rangers Zoid or Zord or something, like, you know. Yeah. I was into that shit, but anyway, yeah. This is yeah, this is I, cool, though. If I had one place like growing up, if I wanted one, I probably would have gone for a Batcave. Well, fuck, you know? yeah. I mean, yeah. That's just, the, I don't have, I don't remember ever having one, but I probably should have, honestly. You just had mainly figures, I take it? I mainly had figures, too, and, like, yeah. a couple Batmobiles, but that was it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so. Uh, moving on, then, we can also cover the Steve Englehart treatments. We covered this briefly last time, but it looks like Steve Englehart came up with the Descent into Mystery type sequence, in a way. Oh, shit, that the showcase. shows up in his early stuff, yep. So it does have Batman driving Dick Grayson, and it says that he turns onto a half-hidden, one-lane but paved road. 100 yards later, he wheels towards a copse of trees. So the whole forest entrance, that type of stuff. Uh, before he reaches them, the trees in the ground below then drop on a pivot and a metal roadway slides into place. A hillside farther ahead opens for the Batmobile's entrance. Pretty Again, cool. Burton did this so well. It's God, it's almost as if the forest is alive. You know, yeah. it's like mm -hmm. uh, it, the forest is a character. You only see it a little bit in darkness, but... Uh, it's, you know, Burton just so good with the, with the ambiance, right? It's, it's, yeah. Every time I see this and think about this sequence, it almost gives me goosebumps. Yeah. Just, it just does. thinking about it. Like, yeah, mm -hmm. it's just Burton, Burton design or was the head of designing these woods, you know, and it's just great. 
I know it's we're almost hard to back imagine. caves right now. This yeah. is the outside of it, but still, this is the kind it's, of the entrance related. to it. It's yeah. related, yeah. It, it's hard to imagine it without it because it's yeah. like you look at the you look at the other versions, you look at the '60s show, and you're just like, oh yeah, there's there's not a forest really there. It's just this, the cave, it's the Bronson Cave, and he just comes out of it and just goes onto the road. But which is in the uh, middle of fucking Hollywood, man. Yeah, that yeah, fucking in, entrance and exit, like. If you if if you guys listeners out there if you ever visit LA, like mm-hmm. it's really like right in the middle of the city, and it, you know it it's interesting how they shot it for sure. Yeah, definitely. Because like when you get to it, you're just like, this is the Batcave entrance. Like you could be, like I'm surprised sometimes that they could fit the car in there. Yeah, yeah. When you actually yeah. go inside, you're just like, man, this would have been like I would have been worried <laughs> driving out that you were just going to like basically get right up against the wall and basically destroy the paint on the side. That's why Burt Ward was afraid on that first day of shooting. You know, that, that, that whole sure, story yeah. he always tells about? <laughs> like, yeah. Batman is a stunt driver, but it's actually Burt Ward in it's the still car. Still Burt Ward, yeah. yeah. And he's like, where's where's uh, where's Adam? And, and he's like, he waves one. over there from getting a coffee. <laughs> like, literally, yeah. that's that's what happened, apparently. I I also know that I think David Goyer and Chris Nolan used to do walks around the Bronson Cave when they were developing Batman Begins. Which That's pretty, pretty cool. cool, man. Yeah. That's pretty cool. So uh, it's great. I wouldn't be surprised if Matt Reeves did some walks there too during oh, his time for brainstorming sure. the Batman. For sure. It's right there. <laughs> it's a... Yeah, it's right It's right there. And of course, he's a 60s Batman fan. So yeah, yeah, yeah. It would make sense. So the Batcave is said to contain exotic trophies of the Batman's le- legendary career, and Batman eventually ends up leading Dick Grayson up the stairwell up to the grandfather clock to reveal, hey, we're actually inside Wayne Manor, and I'm actually Bruce Wayne. Englehart also implies that Bruce spent his training and preparation down in the Batcave for several years, saying that Bruce, quote-unquote, went underground. So that's an interesting take on it. Uh, Englehart changes the Batmobile and or the Batcave entrance in his second treatment into something that isn't really close to what we saw in 89, but is close to something else that we've seen before. So it says that he is driving in the city with Dick Grayson riding shotgun, and he uses a remote control device to enter through a garage door and a ramp into an abandoned subway tunnel. Sound familiar? So mm, uh, right. similar, yeah, similar to what we got in The Batman from Matt Reeves, but also similar to what we got in the Batman animated series in 2004. So I guess if it's called The Batman, which is also the name for the Inglehart script treatment, then right. he's got some sort of entrance from the city into subway tunnels towards his headquarters. So I Looks think that's like we got cool some pollution in Gotham, man. We got a fucking green sky. Yeah, this is the uh, <laughs> Jeff Masuda designed version of the Batman series, which feels like it's gotten a resurgence online. I've not seen so much love for it until recently. There's a lot of people, and maybe it's just the people we follow on Twitter, there's a lot of fans of this cartoon who find it to be like, this is one of the best ones. Or in, and some even saying it's a better Batman cartoon than Batman the Animated Series. People it is accepting, underrated. People accepting Batman and Robin these days really mm-hmm. is a sign of you just give something a little time. Yeah. People will love it. Like, I see this with Man of Steel all the time. Like, mm-hmm. there was so much hate for that movie. And now maybe it's just the fucking algorithm or something that's just that knows I like the maybe movie or something. <laughs> it probably is that, but still, it's just kind of surprising how there's just a lot of people that really do like Man of Steel now. It seems like yeah, yeah. And then with with this one with the Batman animated series, like I think it was it was shat on so much in early 2004, or so simply because it was just not BTAS. It wasn't Bruce Timm. It wasn't Kevin Conroy. It wasn't Mark Hamill. So I think. Fans just at the time just couldn't accept it. They didn't like the new designs, and I think they didn't like the new designs because it wasn't Bruce Tim designs. I you think you gotta a certain... strike it on your own, man. Like you said, you gotta yeah, have a I take. Know. Yeah, you have to yeah. have a take, and they certainly had a take. You can agree or disagree, but this is, you know, this is where we got your uh, your favorite Norwegian black metal Riddler <laughs> yeah, out of this. Honestly, dude, I want to see more of him. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> he's cool. Check out the show. <laughs> I think, I think you'll like his version of the Riddler. <laughs> he that. starts burning churches and shit. <laughs> uh, oh, man. It's a little too much for 2004. Probably. Kids WB. Probably, yeah. No, that, that's, that's true. That's true. <laughs> Damn, Maybe dude. if they did a modern HBO Max updated version of this, they could do Yeah, that. that's right. They already did Riddler in the Reevesverse, though, so I don't know what they're going to do. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, that was a cool, yeah. kind of a cool take. You got yeah. to respect the past. 
but you do have to kind of push it forward at the same yeah, time. Embrace the future. Embrace mm-hmm. the future. Yeah, you have, which yeah. is involved having a take. So yeah, yeah, yeah I agree. Uh, so Batman still has a crime lab and the red bat phone in the Engelhard script. So I think that pretty much covers it with the Bat Cave. Let's go into the comedy gold. That was Bob Kane's Return of the Bat of Return of Batman script. Not to be confused, oh, Return of the Batman by Michael Uslan. But yeah, Bob Kane's The Return of Batman. Apparently, the entrance is you have to rub the bust of Bruce Wayne has a bust of himself in the library. <laughs> and if you rub the head of it, it causes a library panel to slide open and reveal it's the It's not a Bat 10 Cave. plus broad you have to rub <laughs> that Bob Kane wrote in there. Well, no, the 10 plus broad who is Selena rubs the head of the bus. Oh, that's right. We made fun of this part. Yeah. And then, and then, of course, it causes the back cave entrance to open. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just I want, sure I want her touching him some way or another in this picture. <laughs> yes. So it says that she descends a long, winding stairwell, which leads to a vast underground cavern that ensconces an ultra modern scientific laboratory. So, again, this emphasis on. The Batcave is a laboratory, a crime lab. Batman's a scientist. This is stuff that I feel like kind of gets forgotten over time. Everyone's just like, oh, yeah, it's the Bat computer and the Batmobile parks there. And then there's a giant T-Rex somewhere. But the, there's also kind of this forgotten element, I think, of the crime lab that I'd like to see more of in the future. Yeah, it's all part and parcel of the detective shit, right? Yeah. That is the detective work. I think a lot of times, especially in movies, God, maybe they just don't want to see Bruce Wayne behind a fucking beaker and a microscope, you know? But... <laughs> Honestly, yeah. I think that'd be cool. I'd, I'd like to see more of that. So Yeah. Yeah, I'd be down to see that. Yeah. So it's not just always him at the computer and stuff. He's like at the microscope. He's recording data. He's like doing experiments, yeah. that type of stuff. Yeah. You know, similar stuff to like even Spider-Man No Way Home had that, you know. Lots Peter's of that. Doing that. Yeah. Let's say the poison ivy is in Reeves Batman too. Like, you know, there's mm-hmm. got to study some plant life or some shit under the microscope. You know, something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. You know, it writes itself, guys. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So that is it for Bob Kane's version of the Batcave. Let's go into Sam Hamm. So we're finally caught up to the 1989 version. Uh, Sam Hamm writes in the script, quote, We all know this place, although we haven't had time to acquire the familiar mementos. The dinosaur, the giant penny, the Batcave is unmistakable. So Hamm is deliberately saying, like, this is before those momentums, you know, mementos come in but we're not downplaying the idea that they could come in. So this could be why Ham brings in the giant penny in the Batman 89 comic series that was out last year. So it, it would have been, cool. it would have been great to see, to have seen it in like Batflex. Yeah. Cave. Yeah. Cause he's Cause like, he's it's veteran. perfect. Yeah. He's a veteran. He's been through a bunch of shit. Like, yeah. Like Reeves and Bale and all the other ones that are not Batfleck. It's like, it makes sense that they don't have it. Cause they haven't shown that. They're also mm-hmm. kind of starting out, maybe 89, but you know what I mean? Like Batfleck, it was just, it was a really, it would have been a really prime time to, yeah, to make that happen. I'd say, you know? Yeah. I'd say if 66 had the budget for it, that could have been cool. Um, yeah. 89 is a little early in the career, but Schumacher era, definitely that could have worked. Um, and probably not Nolan's, but Snyder's definitely. That could yeah. Have been yeah. Cool. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, basically, Ham describes the Batcave in his script as vast banks of blinking computers, a state-of-the-art crime lab, again, the crime lab, a fully equipped workshop for hammering out new toys. It's the biggest and best secret clubhouse a boy could wish for, which I think is a great <laughs> description for it. Uh, oh, there's also man. a rack along one wall, and Batman picks out a fresh tunic, one out of four, and Vicky Vale wanders over and sees a whole row of bat suits and body armor. When you say stuff, tunic, kind of you mean like a fucking uh, la- uh, lab coat? No, I think he means just a fresh, like, another Batman bodysuit type of thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, I got I it. don't think he dons a lab coat over the cape. Oh, the, yeah, the okay, hamsters. okay, 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 yeah. But that'd yeah. be hilarious. I was just still has <laughs> the on. crime lab in my head. <laughs> Let me put on the coat <laughs> over the cape. <laughs> Sometimes a trench co- coat. Sometimes a lab coat. The goggles. Actually, if he wears a lab coat and the goggles in the crime lab, then he looks like an early version of the Nightmare Batman. So maybe yeah, they were man. onto something with that. Yeah, dude. Yeah, he has to be in the lab as Batman, <laughs> not Bruce. Yeah. <laughs> that, that would be, honestly, that would be kind of interesting. It's like, I like am, don't you wear enough protection? It's like, no. I am becoming... <laughs> <laughs> oh man yeah 
It's like the, the poison ivy sample is going to expire in the next hour. I'm like, no, I have to put this on. Well, I put a preservative on that shit. <laughs> It'll be fine. Yeah. So Bruce, in the script for the 89 movie, he says that he stumbled across the Batcave when he was a boy, like in The Dark Knight Returns, and that he forced himself to keep coming back because he was terrified of the bats. So he forced himself to conquer his fear. So that's very much like the, uh, what we saw in The Dark Knight Returns of, of him discovering it as a boy, and very much like the future Batman begins of him being terrified of bats. So that's I cool. love that aspect. I've all, I always love that aspect, like becoming yeah. your own fear and all that shit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he also, so, this is hilarious because this is, remember this is 1986 when this is written. Batman has a high speed photo processing machine just to help Vicky Vale develop photos <laughs> in this script. <laughs> yeah, that, dude, you know they're doing the best <laughs> they can. Yeah, uh, it works for 1986. <laughs> Obviously, now it's just like what. But, He's got a uh, Polaroid. At, at the time, yeah, at the time, it's because she took pictures of him. Because uh, at the point in the movie, they take off his mask, and in the original script, he actually did the fight in the alley without the mask on. So she has some shots of him without the mask. So he makes a deal with her: "I'll take you back to the Batcave. We'll develop the photos. I'll let you have the ones without my face in them." Batman's got a zip drive. <laughs> Remember those? Yeah, you got, yeah. They were. Do like, you have? Do you have WinZip? Yeah, they were like flo- they were like uh, really thick floppy disks that lasted mm-hmm. for like maybe a year and like, God, probably two thousand two thousand one maybe yeah something mm-hmm. like that before you know the next thing happened mm-hmm. but yeah yeah. <laughs> uh, Vicky also sees the edge of the deep black pit. So Ham actually did write into the script that there was this huge like abyss and things like that, and. Um, because that was original, as we talked about. That was original 289. So Vicky at one point kicks over a pebble over into the abyss, and she doesn't hear the sound. It's like bottomless. She doesn't hear anything. Uh, and just this is just how hardcore Bruce is. Suspended over the pit are a pair of gymnast rings. So <laughs> Bruce literally just go, leaps up onto the gymnast rings, does his workout, and if he fucks up at any point, he's just going to fall to his death. Gotham then is overrun <laughs> with criminals. It is cool because Robin is in the early version of the script and at the end to sort of show that he is now ready to become Robin. He jumps on the gy- gymnast rings at the oh, end. Shit. Oh, shit. So, yeah. Okay, that's so cool they make gy- gymnast yeah. ability. Well, it's the only really connector between him and Robin, I guess, like physically. Yeah, yeah it but makes yeah, sense. Cool. I feel like it's planted, planted just for that aspect. Yeah, yeah. That's that's cool though. I mean over over the abyss is like I know. It's a lot, but you know, whatever. Yeah, it's pretty hardcore. Yeah. Uh this is also something that again, we got gotta keep in mind this is nineteen eighty six. It's not as crazy as it seems, but uh Bruce later brings a laptop computer to Vicky Vale's apartment that can connect to the back computer and helps him trace a call to uh that went to Vicky's place. There's this thing that colleges use called the internet. Yes. I surf on the world wide web. <laughs> so he uh, he ends up having to trace a call there and also ends up using the back computer to verify, you know, use facial recognition to verify that the Joker and Jack Napier are one and the same. So that's kind of a cool thing. I can totally see the images of the two Jack Nicholsons and stuff and they sort of like merge together to confirm, you know, 100% mm-hmm. match, that type of stuff. Yeah, for sure. And then you save it to a floppy disk. Yes. Floppy drive. <laughs> I'm having fun with this old technology today <laughs> yeah. for some reason. I Protect mean, the floppy just, disk. <laughs> yeah, just like every movie in the 90s, you save the world with a floppy disk. Yes. Shit like that. So. Yeah. Or uh, CD and says, Batman Forever, right? Or no, there's a DJ. In, ba- in Batman Returns, yeah, he's got, Returns. The, he's got the CD yeah. where he's recorded Penguin on it. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. DJ Bruce. Yeah. DJ Bruce. It says, once again, there's a long circular stairway that leads from the Batcave to Wayne Manor. So that's a mainstay, even though we didn't really get to see that in 89. Uh, but yeah, pretty much all of this was cut in the Sam Ham script and sort of rewritten into later drafts. So later drafts completely rewrite the introduction to the Batcave. So we don't have, this is kind of sad, we don't have the whole thing about like, oh, like the T-Rex isn't here yet. We don't have the whole thing of, oh, this is the best secret clubhouse a boy could wish for. Like n- that whole description has been rewritten for some reason. Now it just says, quote, another world, a vast, dank world of perpetual night, unchanged by the centuries, which actually is pretty legit. That's pretty cool. That's cool. Uh, 
stalactites hang from walls, cramped, craggy passageways, spiral off, maze-like, descending into darkness, and then an incongruous sight. Vast banks of blinking computers, a fully equipped machine shop, a state-of-the-art crime lab. There it is again. This is the Batcave. So, <laughs> kind of cool. Still legit. It is interesting, too, that he's just like, it's an incongruous sight to see all this technology in a cave, which is, it's a fair point. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, have a bunch of technology in a cave. Wow, yeah, that, yeah that's kind of it, the contrast. You think about it. Yeah, yeah, that is a contrast. So I'm not sure they really meant that when they made this idea up, but that is kind of cool. Yeah, there just wasn't as much technology at the time in the 19, uh, you know, 1939, 1940. It's just bats are in a cave, so just yeah. like that's the only real reason. But, it just hangs but out still, there. Yeah, <laughs> but still, that's cool. That's that's but cool. Dinosaur. Yeah, yeah, it yeah. is. It's a cool idea. So I, I don't know who to credit for that because there were a lot of different writers between Sam Hamm and Warren Skarin, who's the other writer who's credited on uh, the script. So maybe it was Warren Skarin, maybe it was Jonathan Gems. I don't know who it was. Uh, Vicky mentions that the bats around them are terrifying, and Batman just responds back saying, quote, that's the idea. So <laughs> They don't have rabies. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> I checked all of them. We were also meant to see a lab table with beakers and test tubes of Batman testing, having tested all the different cosmetics in order to prove, you know, Joker's sort of poisoned all the cosmetics if you wear them in a certain order. So we would have seen some evidence of him having, you know, actually experimented with all that stuff in order to figure that out, which is cool. I kind of wish we got a scene like that, you know, just Keaton and Michael Goff's Alfred just in the lab with him just experimenting with the different things and knocking off which patterns are which until he finally gets it. That would have been right. Cool. Uh, but the most infamous Batcave scene of Batman 89 is this scene where Alfred lets Vicky Vale into the Batcave. In yeah. this script, it did not take place in the Batcave. Ah. Oh. It took place up in Wayne Manor. It took place in Bruce Wayne's study. And I don't know if they're just like, eh, we already have the Batcave set here. Just fucking bring Kim Basinger over here and let's do the scene here. Yeah. And that's how it happened because, again, there were a lot of rewrites on this. There's a lot of improvised scenes, so they probably made a lot of these decisions like on the fly, where they're just like, fuck it. Let's just shoot it here. You know? <laughs> like the let's get nuts scene was really yeah. <laughs> the day of. Yeah. But I'm, honestly, I don't think this scene would have been nearly as cool in Bruce Wayne's study. I just I don't think it would have worked. Right. I think right. there's something really cool about Vicky meets Bruce in his own home, makes the whole comment about how like this place doesn't seem like you at all. And then yeah. she meets Batman in the Batcave. And then it comes basically to the logical conclusion of her meeting the man without the mask, without the costume in the cave. It's, it's poetic in a way. You can't do this that. Is, it's just the study. He's most open in a way, most vulnerable in the bat cave. Kind of. That's where he's the most himself. Yeah. Yeah. She the finally most gets himself. To, yeah. Yeah. She, she finally gets to see him there. So. Right, right, right. I think yeah. it's, I think it's great. I've, I've never been a critic of Alfred, let Vicky feel in the bat cave. That's bullshit. Cause I'm like, First off, Vicky Vale already figured out Bruce was Batman, so it's not like Alfred was just like, fuck you, Bruce. I'm telling her the secret. Oh, yeah, she had already figured it out, so what the fuck's the problem? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, so there's that, and then Alfred is spending the whole movie, as like a lot of Alfreds do, trying to make sure that, that Bruce gets together with Vicky. She's trying so, to get have grandkids, bro. That's what, it This makes, is Alfred's M.O. right here. <laughs> like, if you look at every scene with Alfred, it's almost like, you know, the young lady is quite special. And, you know, she's, you should go <laughs> talk to her. And he has, like, two or three scenes of that. So I'm just like, there's a whole subplot going on here, I guys. I could make like, Vichy Suave for two. <laughs> <laughs> there's always some left over. There's so. always a little bit. <laughs> At least for one more person. Yeah. So I'm like, eh, I've never, I can kind of get the criticisms of Joker killed Bruce's parents. That seems like w weirdly coincidental. I'm like, okay, that's not my preference. I grew up with it in the movie, but I can see why there's a criticism. This one, I'm like, eh, I'm not, a. I don't really see a huge problem with it. I don't really think it's a big deal. Apparently, everyone right. lost their shit when this happened back in 89. Even oh, Sam yeah. Hamm was just like, I did not write it. Don't blame me. Because apparently he thought that was bullshit. He thought that Alfred should have been fired after that. But I'm just like, it fits the movie. It fits the subplot yeah. going on with Vicky. It fits the subplot going on with Alfred. And it's just, like, look at the setting of the scene. It just it just fits. And also love the fact you can kind of see, you see the Batmobile in the background. That's after Vicky. true. Yeah. Oh, yeah, it's so true. Cool. I mean... 
yeah, if she are, she already knows, then like Alfred really has done no wrong as long as Alfred knows she knows. Yeah, <laughs> you know? but we can Let just me assume. show you something. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, but but yeah, it's uh, it's cool. It doesn't really bother me either. Yeah, yeah. Well, let us know what you guys think in the comments because I know that was a big. It's one of the controversies to eighty nine, probably second, or maybe third. De first one is definitely the Joker killing Batman's parents. I think that's like the dispute, like the most disputed thing about it. Maybe number two is this, or number two is Batman killing. It's and interesting. Then third is this? Go. Oh yeah, it's just interesting. Like we look at this film with rose tinted glasses. You know what I mean? Like there's, mm -hmm. it's just like how Star Wars fans look at Empire. You know, like it can it can do no wrong, but the like the hardcore Batman fans that were seeing it in the theater in '89, you know, this probably did ruffle a lot of feathers. You know, these kind yeah. of things. So there's a version of us in '89 watching this movie. Would yeah. we have been as kind to it? I don't it's know. That, <laughs> that kid in the Star Wars theater next to me going, "Okay, <laughs> um, okay." Like, I don't know. I'd, I'd like he to just think... couldn't accept anything <laughs> happening, dude. <laughs> I don't know. I'd like to think that if you transport us to 89 and we're seeing this for the first time, you know, just like, oh, man, they're finally doing a Batman movie. They're doing a serious Batman movie. I feel like I still wouldn't have had a problem with this aspect. I might I mean, have had more of a problem with Joker, though. It was slim picking. So, like, why not? And plus, like, so much of it is so good anyway. You know, like and then like Kevin Smith, you know, we always brought him up a lot this episode, but whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, he talks about he was there with his uh, comic book men friends. And they, mm -hmm. he said they, he Thelma and louise it. Like, they all held hands while watching the movie. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like that's what I... I was thinking Amazing. of that when we saw the Batman together. <laughs> I felt like we should have Thelma and louise it, but... <laughs> but we, we didn't. Should've. Yeah, we should have. three hours of holding each other's hands. That is true. At least during the... the maybe end. during the Batmobile sequence or something. <laughs> but, but, yeah. <laughs> it was, that's just so funny, man. Initiate that hand-holding once you hear that roar. You feel the... <laughs> You feel the roar of the Batmobile. In that Bring scene. it in. Bring it in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so, oh, man. So, yeah, man. Yeah. So that is basically what covers the 89 Batcave, but we're going to cover a lot more unmade Batcave. Batcaves we didn't get to see, including what Sam Hamm wrote as the entrance to this Batcave, and we're going to cover that after the break. It's time to tap in with the HyperX Quadcast S microphone. The stunning HyperX Quadcast S features dynamic, customizable RGB lighting, a convenient tap-to-mute sensor, and four selectable polar patterns, so it can broadcast crystal clear audio whether you're gaming, streaming, podcasting, or impressing your remote colleagues and classmates. So what are you waiting for? Join the Quad Squad and tap in today with the HyperX Quadcast S microphone. Come on in, what can I get you? Sure, I've heard of Hair of the Dogcast. They're that podcast about video games and beer. From the latest gaming headlines to diving deep into the games of yesterday to sampling and reviewing craft beer from all over the world, Hair of the Dogcast is here for the gamer and beer lover in all of us. Available weekly on the Greenlit Podcast Network. Take a time machine back to before the world went to hell around the year 2000. The 80s and 90s were so rad. The movies, the music, the TV, the games? That's what I want to talk about. If you're cool enough, join us and listen to Less Than 2000, because that's all we talk about. Adam and Chad live Less Than 2000. Lord have mercy, y'all. Do you like hounds? Do you enjoy pooches? Do you find yourself enjoying time spent with that of canines? Talking about dogs, y'all. As you might have heard... Superhero Stuff You Should Know has now teamed up with BarkBox. For every month, you get a box for your special canine. Pooches. Or hounds. That's right. One free extra month if you go to BarkBox.com slash Superhero Stuff Pod. Follow the link and you'll get a free extra month valued at $35 and valid for all multi-length plans. So get the BarkBox for your hound, for your pooch, for your canine. Your doggo will thank you. Support for Superhero Stuff You Should Know is brought to you by Manscaped, the best in men's below-the-waist grooming. Manscaped offers precision-engineered tools for your family jewels. Manscaped's performance package is the ultimate men's hygiene bundle. Join over 4 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with this exclusive offer for you. 20% off and free worldwide shipping with the code 
Johnson's Ball Sack. Yes, that's back for our longtime listeners. Johnson's Ball Sack at manscaped.com. If my math is correct, you'll be serving 8 million balls. That's right. Now listen up, everyone. If you want the Bruce Wayne lifestyle, the billionaire playboy lifestyle, then you've got to shave. And we're not talking about your face. We're talking nose hair, armpit hair, pubic hair. When Bruce Wayne goes out with Silver St. Cloud, he doesn't have nose hair sticking out of his nostrils. When he's working out in the cave, he doesn't have armpit hair sticking out under his sleeves. And after he's gone down on Catwoman, because yes, that's canon, and she's going down on him, Bruce doesn't have a huge forest of pubic hair to get in her teeth. He manscapes. And if you want to be like Bruce Wayne, then get Manscaped through us. I've personally been using Manscaped for years before they sent us these products for the podcast, and I know from experience that they're the ones I trust to reduce nicks and keep everything groomed down there. Now the Performance Package 4.0 by Manscaped has arrived, and oh man, is it a game changer. Inside this package, you'll find their Lawnmower 4.0 trimmer, Weed Whacker ear and nose hair trimmer, Crop Preserver ball deodorant, Crop Reviver Toner, Performance Boxer Briefs, and a travel bag to hold your goodies. First off, the Lawn Mower 4.0. This trimmer is the future of grooming, and dare I say, the greatest ball trimmer ever. Their fourth generation trimmer features a cutting edge ceramic blade to reduce grooming accidents thanks to their advanced skin safe technology. The Lawn Mower 4.0 is waterproof and also has a 400K LED spotlight if you need a more precise shave or if you're shaving in the darkest pits of the Batcave. Because this trimmer is waterproof, you can say goodbye to the mess on the bathroom floor. You thought that was good, but want to take your grooming game even further to the next level? The Performance Package 4.0 also includes the Weed Whacker Nose and Ear Hair Trimmer. The Weed Whacker is also waterproof and provides proprietary skin-safe technology, which helps reduce nicks, snags, and tugs in those delicate nose holes. Their Crop Preserver Ball Deodorant and Crop Reviver Ball Toner will change the way you approach your hygiene routine. Trust me when I say, fellas, your balls will thank you. Manscaped even threw in two free gifts to their Performance Package 4.0, the Manscaped Boxers and the Shed Travel Bag. Bring your comfort and boxers to another level. It's time to take care of yourself, so go to manscaped.com. And get 20% off and free shipping with the code Johnson's Ballsack. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use our code Johnson's Ballsack. Unlock your confidence and always use the right tools for the job with Manscaped. Now back to the show. And we are back in the Bat Cave to cover the other Bat Caves we didn't get to see. So we covered everything up until the 89 movie. Let's cover the sequel to it. So Batman Returns, as we talked about last week, we got a very weird entrance into the Batcave with the whole, you know, put your hand into the fish tank to press down on the Wayne Manor replica inside so that you open up the Iron Maiden. But as you pointed out, there's no fucking way anyone's accidentally going to do all that stuff. You could slip and fall and hit the goddamn Shakespeare head. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and be like, Whoa! and then yeah. fucking fall into the Batcave and the other one. I mean, I love that. I love the Shakespeare head, but yeah. like, but yeah, you're not going to, no one's really going to do that move, you know? So like yeah, I do, exactly. I understand that uh, thinking it is or, bad for the fish. Yeah. <laughs> the pH balance is going to be all fucked up with dirty ass hands. Yeah. That's doing true. that all the time. Maybe you should just take the stairs like Alfred did. But there's also <laughs> there's, there's also the people who, um, you know, some party at Christian Bale's house. Somebody plays the piano. You know, suddenly the bookcase opens up. Like something's yeah. gonna happen. Yeah. So yeah. in this version, uh, Sam Ham wrote Batman Two, which is an early version of Batman Returns. And in this take, Alfred is in the study and he opens a drawer that contains the newspaper of the death of the Waynes, the same newspaper of the Gotham Globe. Uh, that we saw in Batman 89. And underneath that newspaper, there's a switch to flick that opens up a secret bookcase that leads to the whole stairwell going down and into the Batcave. So I think this is kind of cool in the sense that, you know, this article played such a big role in the first one. So 
it naturally kind of gets seen again in the second script in this version of it and also it's it's the whole tie into his parents death that right. i think here it's a little bit more subtle than the what i always thought was a more melodramatic thing of like i set the grandfather clock to the exact time they died <laughs> every <laughs> night so i shit. never forget i'm like i don't know if you really need to do that that's why i'm like i prefer this where it's a little bit more subtle where it's just like yeah. it's kind of there as a reminder um and then i liked as we talked about last time the the batwoman show has a legit bat cave where it's just his mother's pearls and that feels a little bit more of like remembering his mom and the instant at the same time type of thing but it's, mm. li it's still a little bit more subtle than literally like resetting a clock to the time that your parents died yeah so, i mean they want to tie in elements i get it but it's just yeah. a little it feels a little much the no mention yeah. of martha here in this it's just thomas wayne gets murdered what about what about uh Martha, man. It's just a prominent doctor and wife slain in robbery, but like it's in smaller text. Smaller text, that, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Well, I mean, in, in a lot of different versions, it's always, you know, it's always like Thomas Wayne, big celebrity, huge doctor, all this type of stuff. And then his wife was Martha. Like they never really go into <laughs> yeah, a lot of the, yeah. that type of stuff. So it's kind of understandable that when they're doing this back in 89, they're just like, eh. You know, it's just like, it's, right. it's mainly his dad. But, you know, as, as the years went on, Martha was more developed and stuff. But at this time, not so much. Uh, let's see. So going further, basically, Alfred goes to the Batcave, and it's set during Christmas. So Bruce is listening to Good King Wenceslas on the Batcave speakers <laughs> as he's testing the grappling gun over the bottomless pit. So Wait, Sam what's he Ham listening to again? Like a Christmas Good King jingle? Wenceslas. Good King Wenceslas. Okay. That's a Christmas jingle? Yes. Okay, I got gotcha. you. Old school Carol, yeah. So oh, okay. he's testing the grappling gun over the abyss. So like <laughs> even though the gymnast rings aren't back, Sam Ham still got this idea of like, oh, Bruce is just playing around with his toys over a fucking bottomless pit. <laughs> so Right. Listening uh, to Christmas yeah. jingles. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty funny, this is man. Just what he does. Yeah, I'm, is I, cool. I am interested in like when we talked about what Bruce listens to. That's that shit's fascinating. Yeah, it's usually true. like old people shit because it was written at that time. But you know, mm -hmm. it's still kind of kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. I think yeah. I did not cover what Christmas carols he listened to in that episode, but I guess I should do a part two and add. There's more. <laughs> just There's the one, right? others, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Just the one in this one. I I just do feel like. They will never really go into that because, unless it's something like the Christmas thing, because that's like kind of like too standard. But as soon as you introduce like that, Bruce Wayne listens to this, listens to that, that's going to polarize the fan base, and they don't need that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like they want, I mean, I guess he's associated with Nirvana now, but <laughs> <laughs> he listens to grunge. But, but like, it just seems like you kind of have. I've just been, I've been thinking about this lately. You have to kind of keep some elements like musical taste and big ambiguous so that Batman can still remain your avatar. You know, when you, I think that's when you read them. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good point. Yeah. Like it's a lot of times it's like, oh, he listens to classical music, but it's just also like, well, yeah, but everybody occasionally has some sort of classical music if they have the radio yeah. on or whatever, you know? Super safe so. picks like that. Like it can't mm -hmm. be. Well, generally before the Batman, it can't be like a specific, it seems like anyway, it can't be a specific band. It can't be mm -hmm. this or that, unless it like that really is plot specific. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, and maybe other characters, like I could see, I could see like, you know, Hal Jordan being into fucking like ACDC or whatever the fuck. But yeah, with somebody yeah. like Bruce Wayne, it's like, they kind of, they just kind of, I don't know. It's interesting, right? It's just it, yeah. To me, that like kind Tony of thing's Stark's interesting. Now associated with ACDC. That's know? right. That's right. They've got get that going on, but I mean, now Nirvana is something in the way. Will always now be associated with Batman. It went up like fifteen thousand percent on Spotify. Yeah. Or some, some insane percentage. Mm -hmm. That song. Though, of course, I'm just like, it did just now because. We've been listening to that shit since 2020 when that first came out with the trailer. That, and even before well, that, just for liking it. But that's true. I get it. But not everybody's movie, like us. Yeah, the yeah, movie just came out, you know. So, <laughs> but yeah, it was an awesome pick, man. I mean, yeah. there was one reviewer I saw online that she was like, "I don't know why they picked this music," and I'm like, "Maybe it's an age thing. Like you just don't get it. I don't know. I I just always thought grunge was cool. 
Yeah, and it also just ties in with his mindset in the movie. Yes, yes. You know, um, I would not. I brought this up in the Patreon, but I would not be surprised if if Reeves is just like, "Hey, I'm planning to do a trilogy," and like each one is somewhat bookended by some sort of sequence where he's writing in his journal to a Nirvana song. So something in the right. way is the first one. You know, it's going to be something else in the next one. Who knows? Maybe I'm wrong with that. We'll see. It would it would so. be cool. It would tie it all in, or maybe some other maybe another grunge band. But to keep band, it yeah. to keep it Nirvana would would be cool. But if he changed to like Alice in Chains or whatever the fuck, that'd be mm-hmm. cool too. You know, I mean, yeah, yeah. Let us know what you guys want for the song in the next Batman movie <laughs> in the comments. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, in the Bat computer in the Sam Ham Batman script. For Batman 2, Bruce is able to use the Batcomputer to bring down basically these steel security panels over every door and window in Wayne Manor. So he's got this shit locked down. So that's kind of cool, especially because this comes up in the final sequence when Penguin and Catwoman storm Wayne Manor. And it sort of becomes this thing of just like, oh, I'm not locked up in here with you. You're locked up in here with me, <laughs> like in Watchmen. So Yeah, that's, I, a, I like that's his that. best scene, man. But I think yeah. everybody probably thinks that. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's <an> iconic <laughs> line. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, in the script, it is revealed the Beck Cave also contains the treasure that the five families of Gotham, including the Waynes, stole many centuries ago in order to become the five families of Gotham, become rich as they were. So Penguin wants that treasure. He storms Wayne Manor and he takes Vicky Vale hostage, as we see here in this art by our patron and fan, Logan Wood, who you can find on Instagram at Shane Helms one to one. And he did this art piece for us, uh, in which Penguin has Vicky Vale hostage in the Batcave and Batman rescues her and he flings a flings a device at Penguin, which is the sonar emitter, and that causes the bats in the Batcave to swarm around Penguin and cause him to fall into the bottomless pit. So somebody's gotta fall into that shit. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's true. <laughs> so Penguin's dead body is rotting somewhere in the in, in the Batcave in this version. <laughs> Just smelling up the whole fucking place. It's fine. It's all the way down there. It yeah, the smell doesn't true. reach up there. That's yeah. true. So that's that's in the Sam Ham version, but we never got to see that version come to life. Instead, Daniel Waters was hired. He did a whole new take, and we covered a little bit of this in our concept art episode of Batman Returns. We have concept art here. We would have seen, this looks pretty close, but it looks like we would have seen even more monitors, even more computers in uh, the back computer. But it looks like they toned this down for the final film. Uh, this is all, again, this is all concept art from our, uh, our friends at Batman, the definitive history of the Dark Knight book, Andrew Farrago, who's been on the show before, and Gina McIntyre. So check out that book. You can use our link to uh, sort of help us out on Amazon. So that's cool. In... The uh, Daniel Waters script, it's not really that different in terms of the Batcave-specific stuff, but it does show Bruce making shit in the Batcave. So in the movie, he is tinkering with the Batmobile because it turned into the Bat Missile at one point, but it also has a scene that was cut where Bruce makes the napalm that he uses to burn Catwoman's shoulder later in the movie. Oh, so that's that cool. So that would have been planted a little, a little earlier in the original script. Right. Cool. So next, we dive into the Schumacher Batcaves. So, according to our interview with Janet and Lee Batchelor, one of my favorite tidbits from that episode, outside of them, like, basically clarifying the truth of all the whole, you know, the development of Batman Forever, but they did bring up that they had the Easter egg of the giant penny in one of their drafts. They were going to have the giant penny yeah. in the Schumacher movie. It would have made but s- it, a lot of sense in Forever. Yeah. yeah, It fits. You know, you've got, it's an established Batman, and things are going a little lighter. You know, yeah, a little bit sure. more towards the Silver Age stuff. So it makes sense that you would have, you know, Schumacher's the one who could have gotten away with, like, the giant Joker card and the T-Rex and the penny. Like, it's just, it fits that world so much. Yeah. For some reason, they didn't think so. So they, they didn't do it, um, unfortunately. Instead, yeah. uh, we had, I don't know, Batman Forever, the original take was very Batcave-specific. So in one of the early scenes, we would have seen Bruce, instead of, Find, you know, finding the cave at the funeral, he would have found it after chasing a rabbit before his parents were killed and falling into a cave, which is exactly what happened in The Dark Knight Returns. The Bachelors had clearly read this comic. They ended up sort of adapting this scene where Bruce chases after the rabbit, falls into the cave, discovers the cave, sees the giant bat coming towards him, and he would end up quoting The Dark Knight Returns, actually, to Chase Meridian, talking about, you know, quote, surely the fiercest survivor, the purest warrior, glaring hating, claiming me as his own. 
that's all Frank Miller's dialogue. That's so, cool. So I I really think that's cool. I'm not really sure if I can picture Val Kilmer saying that to Nicole Kidman in the final <laughs> movie, <laughs> but there was a lot there were a lot of rewrites uh, and casting changes, of course, as as uh, our listeners know. That was originally written for Michael Keaton anyway. Uh, but even right. then, I'm just like, uh, I don't know if that really fits that movie. But uh, anyway, they did preserve the forest road in Batman Forever in terms of the the lead up into the Batcave because you can see it when he comes out in the Batmobile. Right, right, so right. That is there in the script. It's specified that it is guarded by a holograph of trees. So instead of the cave entrance, it's like a hologram of different trees in front of it or something like that. Oh, so, okay, a little tech um, upgrade there. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. There's also a deleted scene that takes place in the crime lab. So there's actually a crime lab in the Batman Forever Batcave. We just never really saw much of it in the final film, but there was going to be a scene, and they definitely filmed it because we got this image on the trading cards. And it's Val Kilmer's Bruce with Michael Goss Alfred trying to you know, study the box, the device that Riddler was sort of creating and spreading around town with Nigma Tech. Right. And in the script, Alfred opens it. And the entire, like all the interior mechanisms just end up disintegrating, vaporizing. So he can't examine it. He can't see anything on it. So Nigma has thought that shit through in this version. <laughs> kind of cool. Kind of yeah, cool. I would have cool. loved this. Yeah, this is great. A little bit great. more of the detective aspect. Yeah. Oh, man. Release the Schumacher cut, right? Indeed. Yes. Yeah. If it has this, I'd love to see this scene. I really would. This has never been in any kind of fan edit, right? No, because I've never seen it. I've never seen it. It was not included in the 2005 home release. Man, you know, yeah, that's true. You know, with um, God, with Schumacher being gone now, it's really tough because yeah. it's like, what creative yeah. decisions do you make in the edit- editing room? Who, I mean, is the editor for this still alive? Like maybe, I mean, if, definitely if that person's still alive, then they got to do A it. A lot of fans think it should go to Kiva Goldsman. Because he did the mm. final rewrite on the script. And ah. He's still around. So right. it, it'd be cool. I'd like yeah. that. So I guess it, it wouldn't quite be the Schumacher cut so much as the Akiva Goldsman cut in that case. But if he's staying true to the, the script we read, it could still be good. Yeah, for sure. Uh, there was also going to be a lot of training montages with Dick Grayson in the Batcave. So we covered this in our script deep dive into that. But Bruce would have trained Dick at the Bat computer on how to study criminals' behavior and patterns and MOs, and said that Alfred creates a better Robin suit for Dick in the background. You can kind of... You don't really see this in this concept art, but I'm pulling up concept art for the Batman Forever Batcave here, on that you see sort of... Uh, you see... Well, okay, this is interesting. It almost looks like there's two Batman to me. I don't know about to you. Maybe this is... On the left, it looks like there's Batman, but it could just be his suit. But then there's also Batman in the background... Looking at I the think, bat computer. I think that's his suit like hung up on the left side. And then that's actually yeah. him standing at the computer over there. So yeah, that's just an alternate suit, yeah. Yeah. Uh interesting that Alfred is not drawn like Michael Goff on here. He's got that, the bald head. Yeah, that doesn't mean a whole lot. I don't think probably. it means anything. I just yeah. I just think that that's interesting that they, they're just like, Yeah, let's just do the traditional Alfred for this. Uh yeah, Batmobile true. was clearly yeah. Batmobile was clearly designed already. As you can see here. That, yeah, they had that already in mind. Yeah, and then there's almost like these weird... There's a lot more stalagmites you can see here. I don't remember this at all in the final version. Um, and then there's like this weird rounded stuff where all the monitors are, you know, in the background. These yeah, like that's honeycomb so like, type of things. Kind of tie in the visual aesthetic or whatever. Yeah, I guess so. Of the whole place. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Like the the ribbed uh, Batmobile, maybe like I'm. Yeah, kind of. I don't know, that. maybe something like that. I mean, mm-hmm. this kind of shit, especially in a movie like this, it's all all really thought out, thought through. Like it's, I mean, some shit gets through the cracks, but a lot of the time, it's really, um, mm-hmm. you know, everything's on purpose. You know, yeah, <laughs> everything's on purpose. Mm-hmm. So I I think this is a cool look at what could have been for the Batman Forever Batcave. Uh, so Bruce would have had this whole training montage with Dick there. He would have shown Dick how to load a utility belt. And Dick's like, what about the guns and holsters? And Bruce is like, we don't use guns. And then yeah. there would have been like a whole, like them training in martial arts in the Batcave. It would have been really cool. 
if they did that. that I think it was all awesome. cut. Yeah, it was all cut before they shot anything. Mm. Uh, this, the biggest thing though, is this, and that's the major scene in which Bruce Wayne has to confront his past and his fear and go to the exact spot where he fell as a boy and find his father's diary and reconfront the giant version of the bat, uh, the evil Zakrakian, uh, Satrakian, as he's called. Um, so it's implied to be the one that he saw years ago, obviously some sort of poetic hallucination type of thing, because it's not really man bat in this, but uh, it's a great scene. We saw it for a $10 you know, live reaction tier on deleted scenes. It's available online. It's awesome. Um, it's great when it's edited into the movie. It just needs the previous scenes that establish this. It needs the scenes that establish that Bruce has amnesia. It needs the scene that establishes that Bruce feels guilty over his parents' death. Yeah. Otherwise, it's just kind of like, okay, weird, he's got amnesia and he read a book and he saw a giant bat. You know, it doesn't quite, it, the context isn't quite there if you just throw it into the current version. So, so we need those scenes. We need the scenes. And apparently, the evil Satrakian, this bat, yep. was sold at an auction. So if you're out there and you're the owner of this bat, we want to come pay a visit. Yeah, we <laughs> want to you, see this. If, especially if you're in California. If you're fucking far away, then maybe not. But but uh, but yeah. Or maybe. Man. I'll fly over there just to do this. <laughs> yeah. Extend my arms out just like Val Kilmer <laughs> in front of it. Ben's not here this week on the episode of uh, Superhero Stuff. You should know he's out seeing the actual evil Satrakian. <laughs> I wear a black shirt just like Kilmer in this deleted scene. <laughs> Show up. Honestly. in my arms. <laughs> if you fucking, if you own the evil Satrakian, you yeah. could get a lot of money with people. Char- if you charge like five bucks for people to take pictures doing this shit with the bat, you know? I'd pay more than that for this. Yeah. More, I, <laughs> I mean, five dollars at the very least. Yeah, I know. Like right? you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta monetize this. No, I don't know, yeah. but yeah, I mean, I mean, I would do that too. It'd be awesome. Mm-hmm. No, it'd be great. Let us know if you have it. Would love to but, know. I think it was yeah. a private buyer, so. <clears throat> hopefully he finds us i mean if you if yeah. you bought this then you're clearly a fan definitely you're clearly a fan of batman definitely. you don't just randomly want like oh okay some random giant bat thing i'm gonna spend thousands or millions on you know i probably wasn't millions it's was probably it was probably like 10 grand or something I, yeah. what if it's like nicholas cage bought it i could see him buying this kind of shit <laughs> You know he's like I mean? watching this, and he's like, "Oh, maybe I should monetize." It. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know what, Nick Cage? If you're listening, please, you know, send us a message. Yeah, let us know. <laughs> yeah, let us know. Superhouse Pro- podcast. Prove it's at you. <laughs> we need you to prove it's you too, though. But yeah, do a video message. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Please. <laughs> yes. And let us know your version of Egghead that you wanted to. Oh, dude. Yeah. I'm dreaming big right now. We want Nick Cage on the show f- for Egghead. <laughs> Internet, go. Make it yep. happen, please. Thank you. Please. <laughs> uh, so what Bruce reveals in the original script and original cut, but is not in the final film, is the fact that there is a cave beneath the cave. So he goes under a trap door. And that's where the sonar suit is located. That's where the bat wing and the bat boat are located. This is more concept art, by the way, mm. of, uh, of that area. But you can kind of see, you know, even more. I mean, God, it looks so much more cave-like in general. Yeah. Uh, on this. Uh, but yeah, that's where the Bruce gets the sonar suit for the finale. And the Batwing and the Batboat, as we can see here in this other concept art with the Batboat and the Batwing. Pretty close to what we got in the movie. Yeah. 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 So This so art's like pretty cool. Klein. It's yeah. a like dingy kind of cave. I mean, you know what I mean? Like, uh, mm-hmm. not dirty, but you know, it's like really, a, really cave-like, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The you know, for as bright and neon garish as the final film is, this part of the Batcave was pretty good. You know, it wasn't yeah, it, it wasn't overly done and stuff. Even the even the regular Batcave itself wasn't like over the top of that. So um I, I do like I love this concept art for this specific image here. Yeah, it is cool. Unfortunately we don't have the same type of stuff for Batman and Robin. We got this. <laughs> We got a floor plan. It's not nearly as interesting to look at. Oh my god, dude! <laughs> they dropped the ball even the conceptual stage. Well, I guess they well, would have. Because that's is, what we I got. I guess it's not really concept art. But this is this is a floor plan. <laughs> this is like this is this is the closest Dan could find for us. <laughs> I mean, 
wow, so that doesn't exist? Or I guess no one ever gave a shit to take a picture of it. Or it's something. unlocked down or something, yeah. And then here are like some other diagrams. I'm just like, what? These are just cave walls? I don't know. <laughs> Dan tried his best. It's not his fault. It's like a graph <laughs> paper. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's reason for this, I'm sure, but it's just not the same. Yeah. It's yeah. not really... It's not the concept design you're normally used to seeing. No, it's not the stuff I really wanted to present, but we didn't have a choice on this one. Uh, if you guys know other Batman and Robin Batcave concept art, please send them our way. We're going to do the Batman and Robin concept art episode pretty soon anyway. So and if you are Nick Cage and you've bought the Batman and <laughs> Robin concept art, please it's reach out to us. I do. <laughs> <laughs> He's got like in the evil Strachian's mouth. Just puts it all in there. <laughs> Uh, there are a few deleted scenes in the Batman and Robin script that's online where Robin does go through a training simulation, a virtual reality training simulation. Again, probably seems really high tech for 1997, but nowadays it's just literally you're on the Oculus. But <laughs> that's uh, true. <laughs> or the quest. So like, it's getting but back tough in time. to write yeah. sci fi in some ways because <laughs> all the shit's becoming real. I know. You know? So here, Robin goes through a training simulation where he's fighting Mr. Freeze, and Batman criticizes him for it. And there's also a cool bit that has a flashback of it describes a younger adolescent Bruce working with young Alfred on the original Batsuit prototype in the Batcave, implying that Bruce worked on a Batsuit when he was a teenager in this continuity. So that's cool. That's, that's, cool. Cool. that's cool insight. Too bad it was cut. So... That's all I got on Batman and Robin. Wish I had better concept art, but this is all we could get on this. Well, you know. So, uh, before they probably we burned get... it as soon as the movie was, was released. <laughs> probably. I don't know. We'll we'll take a look. I'm sure there's going to be we'll we'll find more stuff for Batman and Robin. There's okay. definitely stuff in the um, in the Andrew Farrago book, Farrago okay. Gina, Gina McIntyre book. It's just not the Batcave. No. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So before we get to the Nolan movies, we had a few other things in between that just did not get off the ground. One of those was the Darren Aronofsky Batman Year One script. So in that version, a lot of the Batman mythos was changed. Bruce grew up on the streets. He was taken in by a mechanic named Big Al, who then died, and his son, Little Al, <laughs> raised him. This is all a replacement for Alfred. But Bruce was basically becoming Batman on a budget. <laughs> like he wasn't, he did not have the Wayne fortune in this script, even though the Waynes were still rich, he just did not... Part of his arc was about reclaiming the Wayne family, reclaiming being yeah. Bruce Wayne. And yeah. So uh, little Al says, hey, I found something underneath our garage. And, of course, he goes down there and he throws a, quote-unquote, heavy Frankenstein-style switch, flooding an immense brick chamber with light. From the high arc ceiling. He presses in the neck bolts <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> of the Frankenstein and bust. And he means like, you know, the big switch that Igor throws. Or oh, throws, yes. Okay, yeah. okay. I gotcha. <laughs> I was yeah. thinking of Frankenstein head. Yeah, bust. yeah. No, no, no. It's, it's that part. Because that threw me at first. I'm just like, what is he talking Oh, yeah, that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. I understand now. So it says, from the high arch ceilings hang bare bulbs, tangled pipes, winches and chains, industrial lace, drills and presses line the walls, all covered in dust. The terminus of a rusted train track lies on the floor. Big Al brings up that, um, I mean, Little Al brings up that uh, his father, Big Al, bought this place from the Wayne Corporation. It used to be a repair shop for the trains. Back in the day, Wayne Corps built a lot of the infrastructure for Gotham City. Water systems, electrical, sewers. This place connects to the access tunnels. It's a, like a maze back in there. Runs all under the entire city. But this is basically the makeshift Batcave. So it is Wayne property... It used to be part of a train system, and it connects to a bunch of tunnels. Sound familiar? So yeah, that's good. We've got once again the Batman connection with the Darren Aronofsky thing. And when I revisited the script recently, I noted that it did describe that Bruce sort of puts more stuff in it, and some of that stuff includes workbenches as well as a giant hydraulic lift for his Batmobile, which mm -hmm. is kind of what we saw on in the Matt Reeves version with that Batmobile as we can see in this image. So, again, hell of a coincidence if Reeves has not read that script. But it is, it's pretty much the precursor to the Batman that we got, that script. You think uh, you think he took a trophy uh, in this movie? Does he? Did he keep the thumb drive, dude? He's just got a thumb on his fucking uh, table? <laughs> I don't. <laughs> Maybe a Riddler mouse. I don't think he has Mary Mitchell's thumb. 
Okay. Keep All this right. in the freezer. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I put a preservative on it. It'll be fine. <laughs> you can put it next to the ice cream. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if we're going to have a Batman in the, in the new universe that collects trophies, then it would make sense that he collects, even from this Riddler, what that would be. <laughs> I don't fucking know. Maybe a Riddler mask. That's what I'm thinking. I guess so, anything. yeah. Would that be weird? Because he unmasked... Maybe well, something from uh, Selena. Yeah, or yeah. or maybe he... If if I were to write him collecting the Riddler mask, it would have been that guy's Riddler mask from the end to remind him what yeah. not to become. That the does make sense. Thing. That does yeah. make sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, That's, yeah. I don't want to become that. That's, you know, that mask that hangs in the Batcave from the first guy I took down. He should put That's that mask on the... Uh, Shakespeare head. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But it's, it's uh, yeah, yeah. That dude. Now, now that's all I want to see. I mean, yeah. not all, but you know, like that. Yeah. I, I think now, now that we've thought of this, I really this has to be in the next one. <laughs> I'm gonna <laughs> be brief, upset please. if it's not. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh man. We need Nirvana. As uh, Bruce is coming back to Wayne Manor through the, I mean, the Wayne Tower through the flooded Gotham. Uh, and writing in his journal, and we need that Riddler mask. Maybe not on the Shakespeare head, but... but the yeah, right. Exactly right. I know you already called it out, but I'll call it out again. And more specifically, what Nirvana song should be in the next one? That's what I want to know. Ben, you said <clears throat> Come As You Are before. Yeah, though I think maybe they won't just because it's been used so much in other stuff. That's so... It's a know, little bit Defenders, too recognizable. Marvel. Yeah, maybe. Um... I mean, he literally says, I don't have a gun in the lyrics. It's kind of too perfect, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, it's tough, What man. else could there be? Yeah. It's tough. I don't know. Uh, I think it just depends on what the theme is. Come As You Are is like, to me, their second biggest hit after yeah. Smells Like Teen Smells Spirit. Like teen spirit. Number yeah. one, of course. Then Come As You Are. I don't know what three would be, but, you know, it's all all off of Nevermind. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I guess I have to fit the script, you know? Yeah. They could go even further. Like, what was that other album? Like, Lithium or, or Bleach? Or Bleach, the, in if you want way back, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. like, I don't know. We'll see. Yeah. Who knows? In the meantime, let's talk about Bruce Wayne, <laughs> the 1990s show that never got made. This is the banana uh, one? This is the banana, <laughs> the banana peel one, the never, banana slip. I'll never forget the banana script, dude. <laughs> So what happened? Yeah, what <laughs> what happened to it? Um, it didn't. It did not go through. Partially because they're just like, well, we would rather do a Batman movie than a Batman TV show. The, you know, you come to now because they're just like, we can't possibly have more than one Batman going on. Cut to that would be 2022. insane. <laughs> You're telling me we could? You can, we can't bring back two Batman and launch a new Batman and have an animated <laughs> Batman thing and have Batman TV shows at exactly. the same time. John Peters is people like, people confused. just won't get it, because I don't get it. <laughs> <laughs> you telling me there's three Batman on the screen? I, don't, I already don't get it. Yeah. It, it boggles my mind. Happen? There's three Bruce Waynes. <laughs> One's old. One used, yeah. to, one used to be Batman. <laughs> yeah. Ah, no. So, at this time, that was just not a thing. So, they're just like, we, we got to pull the plug. But apparently, according to the Krypton site, site on Bruce Wayne, uh, they said that there was a plan that towards the end of the first season, Bruce would discover the Batcave, kind of like in Gotham, where Bruce discovers a Batcave type thing underground. You know they read those Wayne scripts. That, they fucking they probably like, did. got the beats yeah. from it and then went on, went on from there, you know? Yeah, there's definitely similarities between the two. Like, Bruce Wayne is the precursor to Gotham just as much as Batman Year One, the Aronofsky script, is the precursor to Matt Reeves as the Batman. You know? Yeah. They're like, definitely right. gleaning... A lot of the, in some ways, I think our friends at Batman Online were just like, okay, are they done gleaning the, the unmade two thousands Batman scripts that never got made? Because we got, we got, we already got a Batman origin movie with Batman Begins. We already got a nineteen uh, seventies Taxi Driver inspired Batman Year One type of thing with the Batman. We got a Batman prequel thing with that used to be Bruce Wayne now Gotham, and we also got a BVS. We already right. had a Batman vs. Superman, so it's just like, what else you got? Um, but anyway, uh, it says that he and Alfred would have brought in Polish workers and blacked out planes and buses to set up what ultimately becomes the Batcave. Polish Thus finally workers? explaining 
thus finally explaining how they set everything up and it was not all Alfred. Why the fuck is that so specific about the fucking Polish or not? I don't know. That doesn't make... I mean... All right. Anyway. It would have made more sense if they were blind. If they specified, oh. like, the blind, brought in blind, I don't know how they would put everything anywhere, but, like, if they can't see anything, so they can't tell anybody what they did. But if they're Polish, I'm just like, yeah, but they still saw everything. They may, yeah. You know, if, they, if they're English second language, they can still tell the people, you know, in Poland. Right, right, right. Like, dude, it's just one of those things. It like, it's tough. Sense. It's tough once you start to really think about it, it starts to break down. That's why <laughs> something that's already, like, naturally occurring, like the train station yeah. or whatever, makes yeah. a little bit more sense, you know? Mm. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Po- so, the Polish uh, people will never get to the <laughs> internet. This was like when the internet was around too. This wasn't like eighty nine. This is nineteen ninety nine. This yeah. is nineteen ninety nine. Like we had AOL and shit. Yeah. All right. Well, <clears throat> Batman Year One kind of turned into Batman Begins and the Batman. Bruce Wayne turned into Gotham, and then we had an unmade Batman versus Superman before there was Batman v Superman: Dawn of Justice. So we covered this at the end of the last year. But in that story, Bruce got out of retirement after someone, the Joker, killed his wife. So while in a confrontation with Clark Kent, he undoes a metal plate padlock to a wall and ends up placing his palm there, which opens it up and leads to this dark hallway. And in the access tunnel, he gives the authorization code Wayne1 in order to get into the Batcave. Wayne one does not seem like a secure password at all for Bruce that's, Wayne. That's like having <laughs> password as your password, pretty much. Password one, yes. That does, oh my god, dude! Yeah. All right. You would think it'd be like some Zorro reference, well, yeah, you know, man. something to deal with his training, you know. That's you know, right. Like something like that, but no, it's just it's Wayne one. I'm just like really Bruce. Some Aristotle <laughs> quote. Yeah. Or some shit Marcus like that. Marcus Aurelius on being yeah. stoic, you know? Yeah, yeah. Sun Tzu. Yeah. Musashi. Like any of those. Yeah. They 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 drop the ball on that one. Anyway, uh, the Batcave. This is a Batman who has been retired for a while, so it does describe the Batcave as pretty massive. It is five stories, a five-story cavern cut out of solid rock with crisscrossing iron stairways. It says that laboratories lined by supercomputers and below shuttered workshops and training rooms Below, weapon storage. Lower still, the command center. And at the crater's floor, an empty circular vehicle platform facing a tunnel gaping maw. Obviously, the vehicle platform is for the Batmobile. The Batcave then has an alarm asking for the fail-safe code or else it'll self-destruct. Bruce deliberately doesn't give it because he's kind of nihilistic at this point because his wife just died. So he just kind of walks through the whole cave and flashes red as it counts down. And before it reaches zero, he gives the code. And then we jump the shark because a holographic version of Alfred steps out to help him because <laughs> Max Alfred's headroom, dead in that man. Script. Yeah, the Max Headroom type stuff, but now brought to life in like a hologram type thing. So holographic Alfred helps out Bruce. Bruce has a surveillance network with multiple monitors that look over street corners, offices, courtrooms, and even prison cells, including Lex Luthor's prison cell, which ends up playing a role in the plot later when he overhears a conversation that Lex has with Batman, I mean with Superman. So he then goes to a steel door, punches a keypad where he sees the bat suit, quote, armored and jet black, awaiting resurrection. And then, like in the BVS movie that did get made, we get a shirtless Bruce CrossFit sequence. <laughs> so in this version, he's not basically doing the CrossFit stuff, though. He is hanging on a set of gymnastic rings. There they are again. Uh, arms extended in an iron cross position, straining at the incredible agonizing exertion, mind gaining perfect focus. That's cool. Would have been cool. Not sure if I pictured 2002 Colin Farrell doing this because that's who it was supposed to be. Because, again, he just seems way too young for a retired Batman in 2002. That's um, true. They would have aged him a little bit maybe. Yeah, and we definitely would not have gotten him as Penguin if he was Is Batman he... in BVS. <laughs> Did Batfleck do these fucking squats w- with one hand? Or is he about to put his other I hand feel on like he, I feel like he's like he's finished with the rep, and then he's basically letting it go. Okay. So he's already let go of his left, and he's about to let go of his right to let the, the weights drop. I gotcha. Okay. It looks like he's doing one-handed fucking squats here. Does not seem like a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> he's fucking over one side of it. <laughs> unless he's just like, it's, 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 unless it's just him trying to do the squats on like one shoulder plate. <laughs> but that just seems oh, terrible. Man. That seems like a shitty idea. Yeah. So yeah, I, I don't. That's how strong he is. I, no, I think he's just 
he's at the end of the rep and he's just it's it was just captured before he lets the other hand go okay yeah uh and then it also says that it has a similar entrance to 89 again that forest road up to the back cave influences so much afterwards because we see it in like practically everything else the schumacher movies batman begins had it uh and we had it in this unmade bvs thing it's too uh, good man the hidden doorway opens in a sheer rock wall and past a forest and i guess i'll have to look at bvs the the one that was made beforehand but i know the entrance is in the lake but it's kind of a forest area too leading into the lake so it's all kind of connected uh, in the back cave, Barbara Gordon visits Bruce, and uh, apparently Bruce blames AI Alfred for letting her in because he's just like the real life Alfred who let Vicky Vale into the back cave in '89. So he's even though he's AI, he still makes the same mistakes. And uh, it says that we see older costumes, including uh, Batgirl's costume as well as Robin and Nightwing's costumes. So we would have seen those in the unmade BVS. Okay, so. Those are that. Um, we now are going to dive into the Nolan versions, but these are not that different from what we ended up seeing. So we'll go pretty quickly on this. There's not a lot of like unmade Batman stuff or Batcave stuff when it comes to the Nolan trilogy. So here are basically a lot of different uh, scans from the Art of Batman Begins book. Uh, this is basically a miniature model that they made for the Batcave on here. So that's why it just kind of looks funny with this almost stick figure Batman right here <laughs> with like a model toy of the tumbler and stuff. But that's what they did. And then on the bottom are the actual set photos, which are kind of cool to look at when there are, there's nobody in them, you know? Yeah, it's cool. Um, so on the left, bottom left, you know, that's where Bruce confronted his fears with the bats. And then on the right, you can kind of see the brick foundations, you know, uh, that uh, Alfred and Bruce are exploring later in the movie. So uh, it's kind of cool to see, but, Pretty much what they thought of, they ended up doing in the movie, like a lot of the Nolan stuff. Uh, and then we have concept art for the Goose Egg Bat Bunker. <laughs> oh, Here <man>. it is. <laughs> they planned on this. This is what they wanted. They did. This is what they, they wanted. Did. I mean, to be fair, they got exactly what they wanted. That is true. This is this is it. This is what they made. They're going to um, figure <laughs> out that bullet in this set. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Oh yeah, that's true. I forgot to mention last time. There's a there's like guns in the bat bunker that he uses to investigate that thing, or I guess he brings them in. He must have brought them in. I don't think they're naturally in there and stuff. But yeah, I forgot to mention that he does his investigations in there to to study the bullet. Uh, but yeah, this looks pretty true to it. That office chair looks very normal for an office. It does not look like Bruce's usual chair and stuff for this. I mean, it's not uh, his usual yeah, it's just cave, so you know what I mean. Yeah, like, <laughs> it makes sense. Everything's it does make down. me wonder, you know, I'm like, if he retires after the Dark Knight, why didn't he, and he clearly still has the Bat Bunker, then how did he, I don't know, why did he even bother upgrading the Bat Cave in the Dark Knight Rises? Uh, I don't know. He's Because he's waiting on uh, fucking John Blake, man, <laughs> to take over. I guess so. But yeah, here's the concept art for the Dark Knight Rises Bat Cave. It's more concept art for the bat, honestly, but uh, it does have this platform. It has everything that you know we saw in the movie, pretty much. Again, so, not a cool toy, man. Not not what I would do. Nope. But I'm not Nolan, so and he's Nolan, doing Nolan yep. things, you know. Indeed, it's just <laughs> the Nolan stuff just has you know we do we like the movies, guys. It's not that we don't like the movies. It's just it has not done well in the rankings because a lot of our rankings have to do with the visual aspects. And it's just not really the strength, in our opinion, of those movies. The Batcave, Arkham Asylum, the Batmobile, the Batsuit. Like, none of those things are really top tier. To yeah, us. the script, the Joker, you know, it's all yeah, kind of S tier. Those are top tier. They're yeah. kind of S tier levels. It's just these particular, you know, metrics we're using right now or whatever. Like, uh, yeah. yeah. It's like just, you know, again, you know, we cover a lot of the same territory here, but. Like you just, it's hard to compete with Burton's Batwing, man. And then you get this wasp-looking thing, yeah. I, this hornet-looking, <laughs> like, dude, it's just not, yeah. man. Mm -hmm. It's just a. I know it's supposed to be more realistic, but man, it's just it bums me out. It doesn't even, look realistic. I bum, I get <laughs> bummed out just looking at it. <laughs> All right, well, let's change the slide. Let's go to Snyder. <laughs> so I feel a little better now. 
Snyder's Batcave, yeah. So this is the Snyder Batcave, pretty close to what we got anyway. Uh, we did get this red room type place uh, where Alfred was working on the Batcave, I mean the Batmobile, when Bruce was doing the whole speech about how he's going to get the kryptonite because of the you know the 1% chance that Superman's the enemy. Right. So that stays pretty true. We were going to see a lot more of this Batcave in the Justice League sequels that were never made. So in the original treatment for Justice League 2, as we covered in our episode on that, the Justice League headquarters would still remain the Batcave, just like in the Snyder Cut. Cyborg would also upgrade this cave with a female AI voice to keep Alfred company, I guess. Oh, my God. Um, um, it okay. says, uh, Cyborg also asks Alfred, why is he never home? And Alfred replies, because then he'd have to face himself. Dude, Bruce should point. also return the favor and get Alfred laid. <laughs> Somehow. I mean, he's an older gentleman. Maybe he needs... Uh, Viagra, but it can happen, man. <laughs> you know, Bruce can hook him up with Viagra, yeah. get him on some old people Tinder, that type of thing. Yeah, he's fucking got... He's, he's in the Batcave using, I mean, the, he using the beakers Irons, and the Bunsen burners, that, and he's that. developing a new fucking <laughs> Viagra, man. This is for you, Alfred. <laughs> you you deserve it. Yeah. You don't have to go to the doctor for this. Yeah. Master Wade, indeed. Um, <laughs> <laughs> as seen in the vision I was of thinking, Zack Snyder's Justice League, Ma- Darkseid would have... <laughs> sorry, one second. That's one role they probably shouldn't give to a, a black actor because he keeps saying Master Wayne over and over. It just wouldn't like fly. fly <laughs> I had same. not thought of that. <laughs> it's just, I mean, so if they did... So Idris Elba as Alfred is what you're saying. I mean, they'd have to change those lines at least, you know? Like it just wouldn't have the same ring to it. I haven't thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. As seen in Zack Snyder's Justice League, Darkseid would have boom-tubed into the Batcave and killed Lois with his Omega Beams so he could use the anti-life equation to possess Superman. This sparks off the Nightmareverse. So in the Nightmareverse presented in Justice League 3, we'd have seen the Nightmare version of the Batcave. Cyborg would build the cosmic treadmill for the Flash to use to go back in time and save the day and warn Batman and everything. This would reset the timeline. Flash goes back warns Batman, helps prevent Lois Lane's death. They go into the final fight with Darkseid, but Ben Affleck's Batman would have been killed off. But he would have had a son with Lois Lane. <laughs> Check out that episode to find out how that worked. And uh, Lois, 20 years later, brings her son into the Batcave to reveal that his father was Batman, and their son becomes the new Batman. So the Batcave would have played a pivotal role in a lot of those scenes. So, uh, yeah, that is, that was, those were the plans for Justice League 2 and 3. And it's, it's definitely a risk that they took that would not, definitely, definitely would not end up happening in, uh, if they ever restored the Steinerverse and did a Justice League 2 and 3, because they did not do the Bruce Wayne and Lois Lane romance. Right. Thankfully. Right. So, uh, the last bit is a treat for you guys. So I saved this one for last, even though chronologically it came in between Batman Begins and The Dark Knight. Justice League Mortal. Wait, hold on a second. Justice League Mortal. <laughs> uh, but before that, the Batman. This is a concept art from the Batman, actually. Okay. Uh, of the Tunnel Batcave. Pretty right. much pretty much got this. Pretty yeah. much what we got. Yeah. yeah. It's not really much unmade. Let's go into Justice League Mortal, though. So this is concept art, courtesy of Ryan Unicom, who's doing the documentary on Justice League Mortal. And he revealed this concept art. So this is Batman. We've got the whole abyss Thing going on a lot of stalactites on the ceiling um, and a giant elevator which this massive elevator would take Bruce from the Batcave up to Wayne Manor with Batman changing into Bruce Wayne along the way which when I thought about it is kind of a modern update on the bat pole I know the I was just thinking show. that yeah yeah right I'm just like oh that makes so much sense yeah ah uh, but in the Batcave we would have also seen a massive computer system with a 10-foot video monitor <laughs> that he would use to spy on the other superheroes using the Brother Eye system. So we bring in the giant monitor from BTAS in Justice League Mortal. That's pretty okay. cool, I think. Yeah. Um, so he's using Brother Eye to spy on Superman, The Flash, Wonder Woman, Martian Manhunter, Aquaman, everybody, uh, and, and Green Lantern. And it's this technology that the villain, Maxwell Lord, years before Wonder Woman 8, 1984, Maxwell Lord steals this, uses it against the other heroes, and it leads to a creepy sequence where Batman is trying to get control of Brother Eye to find out what's going on, and the monitor just says, you don't control it anymore. 
Mm, so that's cool. That's cool. Uh, but yeah, we would have seen this bat cave, which honestly, this could have been an S tier bat cave. I mean, just it look looks at this good. Shit. Yeah, it looks. It good. looks amazing. That's why I saved it for last. You see Alfred trying to catch up with his tray of food <laughs> that Bruce is not going to eat uh, <laughs> over here. It's got the giant monitor. It looks like a crime lab over there. The abyss stuff. It just looks really sweet on this. This would have been amazing. On Get that. this playset, great... dude. Yeah. <laughs> again, we... I wish there was. Again, it's it's up to the fans. Fans like you know Robert, who was on the podcast earlier, the guys who can create these like custom toy stuff. You can do it off of this unmade shit because like there's no way you know Kenner, Hasbro, any of those guys are doing stuff off of like unmade stuff. You know, it's too obscure. But it's fans true. can do it. It's true. Fans yeah. can definitely do it. So uh, this is probably my favorite of the unmade bat caves on That's this, cool. simply because it just look at just look at this. This would have been amazing. It does you look know, cool. Been, um, we would have, yeah, if we did get Justice League Mortal, this would have made up for the goose egg bat bunker in the Dark Knight. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Around the same time. Oh, in man. terms of bat caves. So, uh, that is it in terms of the unmade bat caves. Do you have any favorites? Is this your favorite one or do you have another one? I can go back too if you want to. Yeah, I might need to see, I always need to see him again, man. It's a lot of information all at once. Um, I mean, yep. that one, that one is probably, might be the best. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. Go all the way to the top. Let's see. Um, yeah. I did like the darker 66 game. one just because of, you know, I don't know. You just don't see that. I mean, yeah, just unless the you really have a darker this. 66 thing. Yeah. It's yeah. It's cool. Yeah. 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 And when you watch the screen test too for it, it plays off a lot more serious than the actual show. Yeah. They didn't, they, they figured out they needed to inject more comedy, I guess, for the kids. Yeah. I, I don't know. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I guess that's my answer, man. Oh, I do, I love that drawing. That's that's more about the vehicles and shit. Uh, the, this one, the Toyetic one. Yeah. yeah, that one's so cool, man. That art's yeah. great. Big spring. Yeah, I'd love to have no, a poster awesome. of that. I'll be on the lookout for that. Yeah. Oh, so yeah. you got, but you got a bit of everything in here, you know. I I know. Yeah, that's it's Giant cool. Joker card, the penny, the T Rex is over here, the Batmobiles or the battery rams, the Bat Sub. All I mean, sorts of Easter eggs in this. Everything's a great toy. It could be a great toy. Like, love this kind of look, you know? Yeah. No. It's is that awesome. like a bat sub? It's like a bat <laughs> yeah. submarine. Yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> got a bit of everything here. Yeah, there's something for everybody. Is there a bat I don't know hover, why that's hover boat? There. there must be. Where? A hover, hover boat or something like that? Oh, Hovercraft? you mean in general? I thought you meant like in here. No, 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 not here. Uh, but, yeah. I mean, probably. There's pro probably something, right? There's a bat everything. Yeah. There's a bat blimp, you know? Yeah, the, bl the a blimp. There's a bat blimp in zero year, and it played a role in Batwoman this past season. I was just like, what oh the fuck? Yeah, that's crazy, dude. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, let's see. We got... Yeah, though, I'd say those are pretty much the ones, because everything else I'm scrolling through are kind of just... They evolved into what we ended up seeing anyway. So, in some ways, we kind of got to see it. But we didn't really get to see a lot of... You know, the early versions had the emphasis on the giant penny. And the T-Rex, the giant right. Joker card. And right. we just haven't really gotten that on film. Close as we got were the ones we covered last time with Titans and the fact that Batwoman has like a little T-Rex toy to give, a, you know, that sort of tribute. Right. But would have been cool to have that in the Schumacher stuff, definitely. Because that's that's the one to have it, as well as the 1960s I know, they show, missed so. it. I feel yeah. like it's like, it's... It's even harder to explain than the utility belt to people that might not know. It's like, why do you <laughs> want a fucking penny and a goddamn T-Rex in the Batcave? Like, I can just imagine, like, yeah. definitely a lot of producers are like, what, what, what are we doing here? But uh, you need, yeah, you need to do what Mankiewicz did with the whole, like, montage of, like, oh, he's stopping this and that. And you see, oh, right. Like, he's fighting a giant mechanical dinosaur for two seconds. And then... Yeah, it's right. in the back cave. You're like, right. okay, I get it. They're from his cases. Like, that's kind of all you need. Right, right, right. Yeah. So those are our favorites of the unmade bat caves. My favorite is the last one with uh, the Justice League Mortal. But yeah, this has been awesome. And that is superhero stuff you should know. All right, guys. Big thanks to our research assistant, Dan, for these visuals. We'd also like to thank our friends at Batman Online. They recently did their own take on the comic influences on the Batman. And I thought as a quick post-credits, we would point out two things that they pointed out that we did not. One is that the lenses that Batman has Selina use in the club are similar to the ones that he wore in Hush, 
where it reads and identifies criminals. I know that we credited that to Scott Snyder, but the specific visuals of, you know, the red text and identifying people and that type of stuff does look very similar to Hush. So that's cool. Uh, also, a quick corrections department. It looks like I was wrong. Edward Nashton, the name, does not actually come from the 1989 Secret Origin special by Neil Gaiman. It actually comes from an earlier comic from the Question Comics. Oh, shit. So this is probably why I never, you know, I never, I've never read the Question Comics, so I didn't know about this. He had his own comics in the 40s, or when was this? In the 80s. In the, in oh, in the, the 80s. 80s. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Question number 26, written by Dennis O'Neill himself. Uh, has Commissioner Gordon say, Eddie, I know you had your name changed from Edward Nashton to Enigma when you started the Riddler business. So <laughs> that sort of started that. Then Neil Gaiman referenced that when he wrote the Secret Origins comic. So it's actually Dennis O'Neill who is the one who came up with the Edward Nashton name. This is a silhouette of a 15-year-old Riddler. <laughs> this is supposed to be adult Riddler, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's obscure, just like Paul Dano in the movie. <laughs> oh, man, yeah. Oh, man. All right, so let's go into the fan comments, then. Uh, Steve Newton. Steve Newton says, Here's a theory regarding the shot Batman administers to himself during the climactic scene in the arena. The inoculation isn't adrenaline. What if it was Lazarus Pit's solution? All right, Steve. And not I'm glad Venom. That you, uh, and not Venom, yeah. So, like, everyone's been saying Venom. And then one of our other subscribers, Paul G, shared an article with us through email saying it, it wasn't his theory, but it was an article that said it could be Miraclo, which is what our, our man uses to get powers. I'm like, okay, so we're reaching beyond the Batman universe That's, now. Uh, okay, what's your opinion on all this, Ben? <sighs> I mean, this is nothing against Steve or Paul or any of those guys, but guys, the more theories I hear, the more I'm convinced it's adrenaline. <laughs> like the more I'm convinced, it's just it's just not anything comic related. I don't buy that Pattinson's Batman has met Ra's al Ghul and knows the Lazarus Pit yet. I don't buy that he's got Venom. I don't buy that unless unless you have a literal scene where Alfred's like you know this concoction that you experimented from Santa Prisca. You want to like put it in your utility belt or something. Like you want to plant that before he uses it. If he just uses it, then I'm going to assume that it's it's what we've seen in other movies. But if it's something yeah. special, you don't introduce it that way. You introduce it way beforehand. So I get that we want it to have more of a comic connection, but I'm just like, this is very much drenched in year one, Earth one, zero year, and Lazarus Pit and Venom shit is just not around right now. And it's not planted at all in the movie. If Bane's in the movie, then okay. Mm -hmm. I get it. Yeah. Maybe that is what it is. But he also doesn't like get roided up. He like doesn't get bigger from it. He just wakes up and beats the shit out of that guy. He doesn't get superpowers like our man, so it's not Miracle. And the Lazarus Pit would have also made him, like, go crazy, like, for the rest of the thing. Instead, he, like, wakes up to the fact that he's been too vengeful. So nothing really adds up in any of this. I think it's just adrenaline that's colored green. That's it. Yeah, it's the simplest answer is often the right one, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, we comic fans, comic book movie fans... We love to make the connections. We love the Easter eggs. Mm -hmm. I get it. But I agree with Ben. It's probably not anything. Also, yeah. they've already... They just did Bane, like, a few years ago. Like, to be I, fair, they didn't do Venom with him, though. They didn't do Venom with him, for sure. But, like, there's just... Why would they do Bane, man? Yes, they do Joker, <laughs> because jo it's fucking the Joker. But yeah. there's just no real reason for them to do Bane. It's kind of fun to think that it might be that's some version of Venom because it is green, right? I think that vial is green. Yeah. Yeah, but it green. it's like, yeah, why would they be setting this up? Uh, as you know, They've mentioned what? They've mentioned Freeze. They've mentioned, like, Court of Owls. Like, but they've never mentioned mm -hmm. they want to do Bane. Like, it's just, yeah. you know, it's kind of just wishful thinking on the fans' part. And I get it. We all do it. We all want to make the connections. But, yeah, it's just go with the simplest thing. It's just adrenaline, guys. It's it really, <laughs> yeah. I'm, yeah, 100% agree with Ben. Yeah. Sorry, Steve, but thank you for commenting. Yes, thank you for your stuff. comment. Yes. Uh, next is As Fox. As Fox says, also, I'm Italian, and Falcone is pronounced Falcone. Uh, so that, that adds on to what we talked about last time. Uh, as Fox also brings up, also here in Italy, 
So actually, he's not as Fox is not in Arizona as we thought. <laughs> okay, <laughs> really. yeah, we were way off. Um, many people were wondering if Falcone was always named as such, or there was an inspiration behind it. Because here in Italy, there was a case about Falcone and Borsell- Borsellino, and many were speculating that they were paying homage to that. Anyways, uh, homage to that. Anyways, I'm a big fan. I'm always happy to look forward to your videos. Thank, Thank you very you. much, as Fox. So. I looked into this because I'm just like, Falcone and Borsellino, what's this? So there was an actual mob boss in Italy in the 1980s, Giovanni Falcone, and that's him on the right. That's He's got awesome, the gray dude. hair and the mustache. And the mustache, bro. Come on. And Hippocratic he oath? was. That's good. What? <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. love the, I love that line, man. <laughs> it's so good, dude. Yeah. And his delivery, is, man. It's true, yeah. Yeah. We'll do a Patreon episode. I want to do a Patreon episode just on Falcone because uh because originally I was going to do it because we did, you know, we did Riddler, Catwoman and Penguin and then I was just like, eh, he's probably going to be in like two scenes of the movie and I don't really give a shit about Falcone that much. <laughs> and then we saw the movie, I'm just like, holy shit. I give a shit this about guy's Falcone. <laughs> yeah. I care about Falcone. So now we're going to do a Patreon episode for those on the $5 <laughs> tier about uh, all the other things outside of year 1 and the Long Halloween. But this is interesting. So Giovanni Falcone, uh, it says, was an Italian judge and prosecuting magistrate, spent most of his professional life trying to overthrow the power of the Sicilian mafia. Oh, um, shit. So, okay, sorry, he was not a mob boss. Borsellino was the mob boss. I fucked that up. Uh, <laughs> Still, they, they, they took uh, inspiration, it seems like, though, Or right? Borsellino was not the mob. I need to read more of this before I jumped on this podcast. Uh, <laughs> okay, but That's... Borsellino and Falcone were judges. It but, looks like, but they were both killed by the mob. This guy was famous for a while, and then maybe they read about him, and then then made yeah. Falcone the character. Yeah, because it says that he was part of the Maxi trial in 1986 to 1987. 1987 is when Carmine Falcone first shows up in year one, and that's the first Falcone ever. Yeah, in comics. Okay, well yeah. that that definitely so adds up. Then it does add up. If Frank Miller was reading up about this. Then he'd know more. Probably clearly, was, I need to read yeah, more about shit. this because I, I mean, don't know who's a judge and who's a mob boss in this. I mean, he probably was a little famous before all these events were happening, also. So yeah, you know, so it's it's pl- it's possible, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So Falcone and Borsellino were it looks like they were judges, and there's memorials in their honor. Sorry for saying they were mob bosses. Yeah, we. But- <laughs> We'll, we'll I'm learn more about this <laughs> after this episode airs. <laughs> so This is really quick, because I just did a quick Google search before. I'm just like, oh, this guy looks like the guy. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, <laughs> apologies to the Falcone family. Uh, but yeah, that's that's cool, though. Um, I don't have much... In- it looks like it was a bombing that killed him in uh, 1992. Okay. So, all right, we'll, we'll have more information in the future on that. We'll, we'll cover it in the, uh, in the Patreon episode. So there's that. Thank you, As Fox. And yes, then thank you. lastly, uh, one of our fans, Aaron Quinn, gave us permission to share out this message that he sent out to us about the Batman. It's a long one, so here we go. <clears throat> he says, hey guys, love your latest episode. I watched the Batman three times and wanted to share with you my hot take on the film. Okay. I can say that I do like it, but I don't love it because of a few things. All right. First issue I noticed is Batman isn't truly challenged by the Riddler. He solves all the riddles pretty quickly and just doesn't feel like Riddler is a threat to Batman personally. Some might argue that he tries to kill Bruce Wayne, but that isn't much of a plot point. It happens, and it's done. Another argument is that the riddles are supposed to be easy, because therefore the Batman to solve quickly, yet he doesn't solve it, so that makes that argument much worse. I wish the Riddler would have just went after Bruce Wayne, making Bruce have a dilemma where he needs to choose an identity to stop Riddler. The conflict is in himself. Find the balance of Bruce Wayne and Batman. Just my opinion. Okay, so before we go into more, because Aaron had a lot more on this, what are your thoughts on this? Because it does tie into something you brought up to me before with people having the critique on the film that the riddles were too easy. Yeah. um, It's just for them to solve quickly. I mean, what's the point if they're just to solve quickly? Am I missing something here? I I think he was saying that's what other people's arguments are. He just feels that the... uh, I guess it was too Batman solved the riddles too quickly, I think is what he's saying. He says Batman isn't truly challenged by the riddler, he solves all the riddles pretty quickly. I, I think I think what Aaron's saying is that Riddler's not much of 
a threat to Batman. Just in general, not just the whole riddles thing. I don't think it's purely just about the riddles. Yeah, okay. But... It does affect his character arc with the with the guy saying I'm vengeance though you know what I mean like, yeah I think, there is I think that that's, that's nothing to do with yeah. the riddles per se maybe that could have been any villain so I kind of get that in that way mm -hmm. but like you know now I'm kind of flipping my scripts like now I kind of think maybe it is better that a henchman said it because it seems like more of the common man in some way. Well, they're not too common, but more we common had some than the Riddler. Saying that, yeah, we had some comments saying that. Yeah, so like, maybe that does make more sense now that I think about it. You know, we all have the right to re the right to reserve. We reserve the right to change our opinion, day to day. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Also, mm -hmm. that that's a thing. Um, but uh, so. Yeah, I think that's what that's all about. I mean, yeah, it would have been kind of cooler if, like, there was, like, more of, like, a central riddle that yeah. really, like, gave him a tough time for a while, and then Batman cracks the code like uh, Turing does in the fucking, um, those movies or whatever, the cracks the Nazi, yeah. Nazi code. Intimidation game. The intimidation game, Imitation yeah. Game. Imitation game, sorry. Imitation game, yeah. Intimidation game was the Batman Begins code name. <laughs> oh, right. So, I mean, that would have been something like that. Yeah, I did feel like they kind of they move real past through the riddles. But this mm -hmm. idea here about cho having to choose an identity, that's the fucking internal conflict. Has this ever been done in the comics? Because I think this is really good. It's, it's cool. I feel like that's... I, I think that's a good... I don't think that's a story that Matt Reeves is telling in this specific movie, yeah, but could yeah. be one that he tells in the next one. It's um, a That's a hell like of a though. fucking... Uh, yeah, that's a hell of an arc. That's really good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Because yeah. this I, actually I like could it. play with your idea also, Ben, like him trying to become more of Bruce Wayne. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, trying to revive Bruce Wayne because, like, you know, like I keep saying, he's kind of dead. I mean, physically alive, but yeah, spiritually yeah. dead in a sense, right? So... Mm -hmm. Yeah, like man, that it's really good. I mean, this is. Yeah. I'm really. Uh, I think this is great. Yeah. I think so too. Yeah. yeah. I, I really like that aspect. Again, I don't think that was what was intended by the movie, but I like that as like an alternative possibility. Yeah. On it. Yeah. Um, yeah. I feel like the th the fix for this because I can kind of see what Aaron's saying on this, where it's just like he, Riddler becomes a challenge to Batman. He becomes a challenge to Batman from an ideological sense in like the last 30 minutes, not necessarily throughout the other two and a half hours. So yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I think if they, because I, I did sort of, I brought up in the previous episode, I, I wish they went full telltale with the Waynes. Mm, I wish it wasn't yeah. just like, oh, my father was corrupt. And Alfred's like, no, he wasn't. And it's like, okay. <laughs> like it was kind of that, that sort of feeling. I'm like, well, wait a minute. Whenever we aren't going full telltale on this. So speaking of that, whenever Bruce goes to Carmine Falcone, Falcone, yeah, you know whatever pronunciation. I'm sorry, but uh, at the pool table, mm -hmm. I swear that first time I was seeing that movie, I thought I thought Falcone was gonna say <laughs> the, the, the biggest the biggest, gang. biggest gangsters in Gotham. He should have. Honestly, I I. The more I think of it, because at first I'm just like, eh, that's just because I like Telltale and I wanted them to do it. That's not necessarily yeah. the best for the movie. But when thinking about it, I'm just like, you know what? They should have fucking done it because it would have had some lasting consequences to that. It would have had like a lot more lasting consequences to the fact that the Waynes weren't who we thought they were. You know, it would have had it, it, it's the the effect, the personal effect that Riddler has on Bruce would have been felt more, I think, if he was the one who revealed that. And Bruce sort of feels this conflict of just like, well, he did open my eyes to what's going on in Gotham and to my parents. But he's also a murderer and a psychopath and right. he's killing everybody. So that type of stuff. I, uh, I mean, so it would lose a little bit of the... And not that it would need it in every revision or whatever, but in the way it was written with the Reeves one, mm -hmm. uh, Falcone, Falcone is... Uh, so slimy and manipulative because everything he's saying it's like it seems so true and it's just to fuck with Bruce yeah 
I do this like is that a, aspect, though, yeah. This is his family friend. This is somebody that he's supposed to be in deep with, with his, with his father from the past, you know, but mm-hmm. he's just manipulating the boy, you know, in his perspective. You know what I mean? Like, and that's really, uh, I thought that was really good kind of subtle shit going on there. You yeah, know? Uh, yeah, that's that's true. You, yeah. it was the the evilness of Falcone. The yeah, ma- manipulation, man. Everything yeah, he says, you can't trust anything yeah. he says. Yeah, yeah, but also that could have been interesting too because it's just like, well, you don't really trust anything he says anyway because he's Carmine Falcone. But like, what yeah. if he did tell the truth? So it's like it's there's, yeah. there's multiple different ways to do this. Uh, yeah, it's, it's interesting to spec- speculate. Yeah, on it. yeah, uh, yeah. Let's go into the rest of Aaron Aaron's thing. But oh, I think yeah. we're kind of just like. I think we're kind of just like, eh, like maybe you're right on this. This could have been cool. It's kind yeah. of our response on this. Um, Aaron says, another thing, Selena is way too much a damsel in distress. I guess she's not Catwoman yet, but even in year one, she can handle herself and doesn't need the Batman to save her all the time. Um, look, this might be something that we can't personally comment on in terms of like female agency in movies, but as in terms of like writing characters who are independent and things like that, I didn't really feel this. Like, I don't really agree with this. I The only time I feel like it might have been unnecessary for Batman to save her was when Falcone was strangling her. Like, it's... Like, they maybe could have done the same scene where Batman comes in right when Selina's about to shoot him. And it probably would have played the same way on it. So, like, maybe that wasn't necessary, but at the end, you know, she saves him and he saves her. And it's... it's I feel like they needed to do what they did, which is to demonstrate exactly what Bruce says to Alfred, that I'm not afraid to die, but I am afraid of losing somebody I care about. And lo and behold, at the end, he's not afraid to die when he's just literally staring down the barrel of a shotgun. But when Selena is in trouble, then he does the whole adrenaline thing, not Venom, not Miracle, not Lazarus, <laughs> stuff, but the adrenaline thing, and forces himself to wake up. He doesn't do that shit when he's in danger. He only does it when she's in danger. And stuff. Yeah. And then I'm also kind of just like, she saved him, he saved her. It sort of just sort of equals out. And that's kind of like, it's only really two instances where he really saves her. Otherwise, like, Selena gets Aunt Annika's passport back on her own. Like, she's the one who breaks into the safe. Batman doesn't do that for her. Yeah. Batman does take her away when the cop shows up. But if Selena wasn't distracted by Batman at the time, she could have easily hit herself there. Selena handles herself fine throughout the club stuff outside of getting strangled by her dad. And then she's the one who finds the corrupt cop. She's the one who gets the phone with the evidence on Annika. She's the one who figures out that, you know, Falcone killed Annika and her mother. Like, you could almost do a whole comic from, like, retelling the Batman, but from Selena's perspective, and it could still be a really cool Catwoman story. Mark Bernard said something about this, this too. Like, he said that she kind of gives them the biggest clue or something. I can't remember, like, whenever she brings the guy up uh, to the, you know, they're like, uh, was it you? Was it me? I don't know. Let's go up and see, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, there's some, I don't know. It's what Bernard said something like that. and uh, As a criticism or? No, no, no. He said, he was just like, oh, well, she, no. It was like a one of the few praises he gave it. Oh, I see, I see. Yeah. But, but uh, yeah, I you know, I didn't think she was too much of a damsel in distress either. Again, mm-hmm. you know, we're not really, we don't have the final say on this kind of thing. But, but uh, to me, yeah, it just kind of read like she's kind of doing her own thing. And then Batman joins her from her, well, the movie's from Batman's perspective, obviously. But mm-hmm. we could almost have like a Catwoman movie from her of side of this exactly. whole fucking story. Because yeah. she's kind of doing her own thing for a bit. And she has her own mission. She has her own she has her own agency for a lot of it. They just, mm-hmm. yeah, the I, I appreciated that from the first time I saw it. Like they really do, like their their lives get entangled because they have yeah. similar goals. Yeah, they have their own they have their own agendas and stuff, and it yeah. just sort of ties in. You know, she's pretty clear about that too at the club, where he's just like he wants her to stay with the DA, and she's like, no, because this one knows my you know my girl, so yeah. that makes sense. Um, yeah, I just I didn't get the vibe on that. If anything, it sounds like she needs to learn BJJ because both times that she needed rescuing was when the guy was on top of her. So maybe that's, that's true. What she needs. So we need to get uh, more of a whip uh, showcase next time around as well. Probably, yeah, yeah. Uh, all right, this is the rest of Aaron's message. She says, "What I do like is the little details, like after Batman sees Penguin for the first time, you can see the Riddler watching the Iceberg Lounge with binoculars in a barely noticeable silhouette. I've actually seen this online. It's pretty cool. Oh shit! You can see in in on the left." 
of the screen. It's uh, it's probably not Dano, but it's it's a silhouette of what looks like Dano is just sort of looking through uh, from the window into the iceberg lounge. So you know he's always been there. That's cool. Uh, also, after Batman cuts the electric cord and loses his bat knife, the insignia looks like the Batman logo with the ears and, and black due to the knife not being there. I don't think I caught up on that. Yeah, me That's either. pretty cool, though, because he like he basically he becomes the heroic Batman in that moment. That's cool. I got to rewatch it. Yeah. Viewing three coming up. Uh, other than that, Penguin <laughs> is amazing. Gordon is great, although I wish you would have solved more riddles instead of being surprised by everything and asking Batman all the questions instead of giving input to Batman. I feel mixed on this because I'm just like, I feel like if Gordon solves the riddles, then there's no point to Batman. Uh, yeah, Batman's got to be the smartest guy in the room, right? Yeah. Otherwise, it's not great, greatest detective. Yeah. You know what I mean? World's greatest detective, so. Yeah, uh, and I'm also just like, I don't think, like, it definitely would have made the riddles are too easy criticism double down. <laughs> if yeah, Gordon's the one that's solving right. shit instead of Batman. That's right. Um, yeah, Aaron says, all in all, the movie's fine. Sorry for the long messages. Keep up the good work. AQ. Right. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's Thank awesome. You. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and so that is it for the fan comments. Coming soon to HyperX.com, HP.com, and more fine retailers, the HyperX Cloud Alpha Wireless. The Cloud Alpha Wireless gets up to 300 hours of battery life, so you'll spend less time charging your headset and more time charging into action. The dual chamber drivers enhanced by premium DTS Headphone X spatial audio provide reduced distortion, allowing you to hear audio cues with pinpoint precision. Up to 300 hours of battery, two chambers, zero wires, the new HyperX Cloud Alpha Wireless. Over to the shout out. Oh man, here we go. We want to thank our uh, Patreon supporters who are Shasta, Leon Mo, Super Inframan, Douglas P, Dan D, Aaron Willett, Nick Noir, Jeffrey R, Asgur's Web, Alex of the What Mean Podcast, Ian Justice, Jared P, Jamie H, Rochelle L, Skyla, TT, Sketchcraft, Braxton W, Renee V, JD, Logan Wood, who was Shane Helms 121 on Instagram, Griffin W, Daniel V, Pete B, Halsey C, Maurice D, and Jonathan. And we have other supporters. Spike again, SACT Productions, Robert Schumann, Kuke Nams, Matt Herring, Elijah B, Shamrock Balls, Ian H, <laughs> Walter the Wobot, John Wells, Rye Guy, Jackson Putnam, Tway Yin, and Watson, Stage Bat on Instagram, Joey, W.media on Instagram, Paul G, and here I go. Please join the Shasta Army as a $1 tier. Uh, that's a uh, pay $1 a month and you get the shout out. And then a uh, $5 tier, you get the whole other show. I mentioned it a few times uh, in this episode, um, but it's deeper dives. You can cancel any time, binge the whole thing for five bucks. You know, um, that, it comes out every Friday. This show's every Monday, of course. $10 tier, monthly meetup. You, uh, you basically meet in a Zoom call kind of setting, and we have a topic to discuss. That's once a month. And, uh, you know, just kind of uh, chat with us and uh, chat about the topic at hand. So, uh, yeah, that's a $10 tier. Then we have superhero stuff, pod, merch, superhousepod.redbubble.com, superhero stuff, pod.threadless.com, mugs, shirts, shower, shower curtains, <laughs> Ben Man, Indeed Wizard, Zacula, whoever that guy is, artwork by Stefan Santa Cruz. Um, <laughs> please send us some audio to superhousepodcast at gmail.com. It's been a little, not not too much lately. Need to have some more. Please send us many, many audio clips. Mm -hmm. And then um, I'm Thunderwolf Drew on Instagram and Twitter. Thunderwolf lives on YouTube, thunderwolfdrew.com. My whole portfolio, except for amanorecon.com. A-M-A-N-O-R-E-C-O-N.com. There you can see our 17-second teaser trailer for something else bigger that's coming down the line. It's, I uh, think, R-rated Power Rangers meets Stranger Things. And uh, this poster, I forgot to say this in the past few episodes, but the, <laughs> the poster is by Zach. Uh, this awesome poster here. And mm -hmm. uh, it's an original thing. It's going to be on Indiegogo at some point soon. Ben? You can follow us at, uh, Superhero, yeah, at Superhouse Pod on Twitter, uh, Superhero Stuff Pod on Instagram, Superhero Stuff Pod on TikTok, 
On Vero, we're also Superhero Stuff Pod. Shout out to Comp Capital on Instagram, as well as the Everything Entertainment Club on Clubhouse. My website is benwanrider.com, where you can also read my Gotham script, Gotham Vampire, where young Bruce faces off against the Mad Monk from Detective Comics 31, uh, as well as my spec script for Elementary called The Death of Sherlock Holmes, a modern update on the classic story, The Adventure of the Dying Detective. And Curb Your Enthusiasm, Disneyland, the Curb episode they could never make, where Larry David goes to Disneyland. My YouTube channel is in the description below, where you can also check out Doctor Who, The Ronin of Time, where the 8th Doctor meets Miyamoto Musashi. My Instagram is at BenWanWriter. My cat's Instagram is Alfie Pennyworth Cat. You can see him in the background here. He's just chilling. Uh, but uh, <laughs> if you have a cat too, uh, you can check out Alfie Pennyworth Cat and get the Whisker Box, the only cat box for the crazy cat lady and gent. And if you don't have a cat but you have a dog, that's cool too. You can get the Bark Box, y'all. Give your dog exactly what they want, which is the Bark Box. Get Basically, use our promo link Get the first month off free, valued at $35, get the Bark Box. All that stuff is at SuperheroStuffPod.com slash shop. You can get the Bark Box, you can get Whisper of a Days, you can get Amazon stuff, including the Batman Definitive History of the Dark Knight by Andrew Farrago and Gina McIntyre with a whole bunch of concept art that we use for our episodes. Back to Andrew. And you know what? We want you what? to do us a favor. We want you to tell all your friends about this. You know what? I'm glad you did. <laughs> <laughs>